Chapter 13 G-550 Jet, 30,000 Feet Over the Red Sea Khaled had told them that the prince was safe, and as soon as their chopper was out of range, the attackers had simply melted away. It was obvious now that they were the only targets. Matt had the bandage on his hand peeled back, and was looking at the skin where the dog had bitten him only hours ago. His heart beat faster as he stared. There were some indentations in the flesh, but the wounds had fully healed. What the hell is happening? he wondered. He stared hard at the flesh, as if trying to see beneath the skin to the muscle, blood vessels, and bones below. He had a sinking mat glanced back over his shoulder, and then shook his head. Maybe Greta will carry her the whole way. Or maybe one of them. Rachel's teeth showed as she then glanced at the six burly men who Khaled had brought with him, obviously some of the prince's special forces bodyguards. So now we have these guys with us. She had her hands on her hips. I knew I should have asked Wybrow for more backup. She sighed. You leave a vacuum and some asshole fills it. That's a nice image. He grinned. Look at the upside. Matt leaned closer to her. Where we're going isn't exactly the safest spot on Earth. So having a team of hardheads with us can only be a good thing. Besides, you do remember Najif's estate, right? She turned to him. I'm not debating that. All I'm saying is, I wish they were our hardheads. He chuckled. I hear you. Rachel settled back into her seat. How long? Matt checked his watch. Another six hours before we arrive at N'Djamena International Airport. He eased back. You know much about Chad? Nada. But I hear it's very nice. She pulled in a cheek and snuggled lower in her seat. Some would say it's a melting pot of different ethnicities, cultures, and religions. Others would just call it a boiling crucible of violence. Right then, so not that nice, huh? She smiled. Give me the thumbnail sketch. An old country in an old continent. He crossed his hands on his stomach. People have been living in the Chadian Basin for many thousands of years, and it was once one of the crossroads of civilizations. One of the earliest empires was the legendary Sao, that had existed there since 3000 BCE. They were an ancient race, only known from their artifacts. The Sao fell to the Kanem Empire about 2000 years ago, who in turn fell to Islam and the Safwaya rule about 1000 A.D. He turned to smile at her. Who then fell to the Bulala, invaders from the area around Lake Fitri to the east? The desert reclaimed much of the empires then, and the people scattered across the land. It wasn't until the French arrived around 1900 that they took to stopping the tribal warfare and secured full control of the colony, and incorporated it as part of French Equatorial Africa. Matt bobbed his head. The French granted self-rule to Chad after World War II, and then that's when the despots and tyrants took over. Bloody history, she grimaced. It gets better, or rather worse. He sighed. Just in 2013, Security forces in Chad foiled a coup against President Idris Deby. You want to be a ruler in Chad, you've got to have eyes in the back of your head. A muscle in Rachel's jaw twitched. Now I really wish I did ask for more backup. He sighed. I guess we work with what we've got. Yep, and we'll soon find out if these stuffed suits of Khaled's know what they're doing. Rachel raised her eyebrows at him. Matt glanced quickly back at the bulky men packed into the rear seats. They looked pretty tough to me. I wouldn't want to pick a fight with any of them. Rachel reached across to stroke his cheek with the back of her hand. 
You, dear, are here for your brains. Matt laughed and turned back again. He saw that a pair of the group, seated at the very back, seemed more normal-looking, even nerdy. Well, most of them looked tough. One of them lifted a hand to wave, and Matt nodded back. I think a few of Khaled's team are the specialists he mentioned. Excellent. Then at least he's done something right. Rachel eased back and turned to the window. Matt sighed. Wake me when we get there. He closed his eyes. He turned his mind to the ancient Roman map of the country, and also the stained glass representations of some sort of destination. The problem was that given the scale ratio, the map endpoint was somewhere, nowhere, out in the desert. Matt tried to get comfortable. He wanted to sleep, but didn't feel tired. The strange thing was he needed less and less sleep, but was feeling more and more invigorated. In fact, his entire body, inside and out, tingled with a weird energy. He licked his lips feeling thirsty, sort of, but not desiring water. It was something else he craved, but couldn't think what. Matt opened his eyes a slit and peeked under the bandage on his hand. There was nothing now, no weeping wound, scabbing, or even a scar. Impossible, as the bite had been bone deep and only happened half a day ago. He took off the bandage, rolled it up, and stuffed it into his pocket. He flexed his fingers. He had a sinking feeling in his gut. And then there was the bomb blast. That was something else he had walked away from. In the haze following it, he had fragmentary memories, like torn pieces of a photograph with many bits missing. There was a man, tall, broad, and bearded, who had talked softly to him. Welcome, Brother Matthew. Did he really say that? Or was it just a load of damaged neurons in his brain, misfiring after the explosion? What's happening to me? he wondered. Infected, his brain whispered back. Impossible, he thought. You know it's true, his mind sneered. Don't think about it, he demanded of himself. He wriggled in his seat, trying to relax, and began the waking dream of the beautiful, tall woman rising from the sparkling blue water. She made his heart leap in his chest, but also calmed him. Professor Kearns? Matt jolted forward. What? Dr. Joshua Gideon. The man adjusted a pair of wire spectacles, and then sat on one of the seats facing Rachel and Matt and stuck out a hand for Matt to shake. Rachel opened her eyes, and he shot the hand back out toward her. And Agent Bromelow, I presume. I'm from the parasitological department of Tel Aviv University. He smiled and shrugged. You might say I'm on loan. She frowned. Really? How are you guys even working together? He bobbed his head. Relations are good right now. We're both allies of the U.S. who share a concern about the Middle East. We cooperate on numerous things. And more importantly, Prince Najif has a lot of connections. He grinned. I think I was summoned and on my way before your dinner with the prince was even finished. Pardon me, Joshua. Another older man excused himself and squeezed himself and his large stomach into the last vacant seat over from Joshua. Abdul Ibadi, archaeology. He shook hands and sat back. I specialize in ancient religious artifacts and history. I also cross-majored in geology. Perfect, that'll come in handy. Matt turned to Rachel. See, this is more like it. You can never have too many eggheads, she said. But Mr. Ibadi... I think my little friend here has got your field covered, she nudged Matt. Maybe, he said, but my knowledge is primarily focused on religious studies, 
I even worked on the Babylonian tablets. No way. Matt moved to the edge of his seat. From the Mesopotamian excavations. Yes, indeed. And they're possibly the world's oldest clay tablets that contain a flood story. He smiled at Rachel. They were discovered by the British Museum Archives curator Irving Finkel, and they specifically mention an ark and the flood. Matt grinned and looked briefly at Rachel. Babylonian, and dated around 1750 BCE. Maybe the oldest telling of the biblical tale anywhere, any time. Ebadi nodded. You might say I specialize in archaeology as well as archaeology. He chuckled and held up a hand flat. Matt high-fived it. Rachel exhaled through pressed lips and looked back out her window. Matt turned to Joshua. And I'm betting you're here because you obviously heard about the biological samples we discovered. I am. And I must say I'm beyond intrigued. The information that was forwarded from the FBI laboratories was extremely useful. What? Rachel sat bolt upright. What information and forwarded by who? Hey, thought you were dozing. Matt leaned away from the bristling woman. We got a briefing pack on the stained glass images, as well as the parasites. Joshua seemed to search his memory for a moment. Ah, uh, from Assistant Director Vinow or Wynow? He was pretty high up. Wybrow. Just perfect. Out of the fucking loop once again. Rachel got to her feet and paced up toward the front of the plane. Professor Ibadi frowned, probably at Rachel's burst of profanities, but just momentarily tightened his lips and then turned back to Matt. This is a dream fieldwork opportunity. Let's hope it stays that way. Pretty hostile territory we're entering, Matt said. Rachel had paced back. Pretty hostile where we just came from, she added with a tight smile. Matt sighed. Yeah, there are hostile forces at work, been several attempts on our lives. We heard, Joshua said. I think that's why we brought them. He thumbed over his shoulder to Khaled's commandos. Rachel flopped into her seat, her face like thunder. Matt grinned. And I brought her. She scowled, but Matt ignored her. So what did you make of the organism? It's weird, to say the least. Joshua raised his eyebrows. Sure is, weird and unique. We mammals, and in fact all animals, have been hosts to all sorts of intrusive creatures for millions of years. Did you know that they uncovered a T-Rex skull with trichomonas boreholes in it? Parasites have been around longer than we have. But in human beings... Have you ever seen anything like this? Matt asked. Not exactly. Joshua bobbed his head. No, never. We normally deal with two types of parasites. There's the ectoparasites, like fleas, scabies, nits, and the like, that infest the external realm of our bodies. And then there's the endo-armies, that live in our organs, blood, and cells. The harmful ones, right? Rachel said without turning. Sometimes. The dumber they are, the more harmful they are. The smarter ones can actually alter their environments, alter us to be better, healthier, and stronger. The healthier we are, the healthier their homes are. And, of course, the really exceptional ones are the symbiotes that are beneficial to us. We give them a home and food, and they look after us. Sounds like what the worms were doing to the human body, extending life and health, Rachel said, turning to face them. I'm going to ask a dumb question. Matt faced a body. Have you ever heard of something like this in your religious studies, anywhere? This seems somehow to be inexplicably linked to the biblical flood. There's always been an association of worms with biblical plagues. Ebadi said. 
There's the taking down to the worms, referring to the degradation of mankind, in just about every holy book. But there's nothing I know of that offers some sort of divine immortality. The man seemed to think for a moment. I would have thought that would have been godlike, and for man to aspire to it would be seen as blasphemous. Matthew, Eleanor's voice floated up from behind them. His master's voice, Rachel smirked. Oh, boy, Matt muttered before turning in his seat. Yes, Eleanor. Come back here, dear, and tell me what you're talking about. Rachel half turned back to the window. Go on, dear. Go tell Mummy what you've been doing. Matt groaned and leaned towards Joshua and Ibadi, lowering his voice. She's not really my mother. He stood up. Excuse me. He headed down to the rear of the plane, where Greta and Eleanor waited. Ladies, Matt sat facing both the women. How's your flight been so far? The old woman pursed her lips, her eyes half-lidded. Long, uncomfortable, and very down-market. She half turned to the large men just back from her. And overly crowded. We're nearly there now. But we did warn you that it wasn't going to be very pleasant. Matt smiled patiently. That was supposed to be when we arrived, not when we were traveling. Her eyes slid to Khaled, and her lips pursed momentarily. Please sit down. Eleanor smiled sweetly. You haven't yet told me what the specialists are talking to you about. They look more like the bookish types, scientists like you, are they? Matt nodded. Religious expert and a biologist, Prince Najif has managed to assemble quite a good team, plus security. We were just talking about the evidence as we now know it. Nothing you aren't aware of, so no new revelations yet. Matthew, her voice became softer. Thank you for helping me. You are the only one I trust. She eased herself closer and put a hand over his. I'll do what I can. Matt patted her hand that was little more than wrinkles over gristle. He looked to Greta and smiled. But the large woman never flinched, and in her eyes he saw something unpleasant. Matt slapped his hands down on his knees. Well, if I find out any more, I'll let you know. Like I said, only a few more hours now, and probably not long until we start to cross into Chad. Goody. Eleanor eased back into her seat, and Greta pulled a blanket around her shoulders, making her look even more like a tiny animal snuggling back into its nest. Matt walked back to his seat and sat down. Joshua and Ibadi had left, maybe frozen out by Rachel. Her eyes were on him. Well, she asked. He shrugged. She's impatient, uncomfortable, and bored. Welcome to the club, Rachel snorted. And how are you holding up? She looked at him from under lowered brows. I've never known anyone to have such bad luck, or is it good luck, in my life. Don't worry about me. I'm a survivor, and I'm lucky. Right about now, I'm just looking forward to what we might find. He swallowed and looked away from her eyes. Rachel grunted and settled back in her seat. Well, just make sure you save some of that luck for where we're going. I hear we might need it. Me too. Matt settled back, closed his eyes, but still couldn't sleep. Chapter 14 N'Djamena International Airport, Republic of Chad Khaled's plane taxied into the airport, stopping several hundred feet from the main doors. Security was little more than six feet of wire fencing, running around the perimeter of the runways and airport building. Men, some in uniforms, some not, 
seemed to wander around and over the runways. Khaled joined Matt and Rachel. We will be met by a local official. We should not need to enter the main airport building, but... He shrugged. Things tend to change quickly here. Be ready to move on my word. He straightened. Matt got to his feet with Rachel, and Joshua and Ibadi stuck close by, probably preferring Matt's company to that of Khaled's Saudi commandos, or worse, spending time with Mrs. Eleanor Van Helling and her intimidating companion. The door was pushed open, and Matt heard a greeting in Arabic. Khaled responded and was first down, smiling broadly. The waiting official had a shaved head and was the color of dark coffee. He wore a blue suit that was dust brown from the knees to his shoes. Khaled shook his hand vigorously as the Saudi's security team came down the steps and fanned out, their eyes moving from the low buildings to the trucks and then lingering on the stragglers moving across the airfield. Matt bet they were armed, but doubted there'd be any sort of screening when he saw Khaled hand over their passports for stamping, plus a thick envelope, which vanished into a breast pocket, as if it were something unpleasant. Matt and Rachel came down next, and to her credit, Eleanor managed to be carefully led down the steep steps, which took a while but proved she was mobile when she really wanted to be. Oh, God, Rachel winced. The heat was as bad as Saudi Arabia, but here there was very little sense of the healthy, clean air from the Saudi capital. Instead, what was in the Chad air were bugs of a frightening size and number. Matt turned to a body. Now this feels like a biblical plague. It'll be better when we're away from the city, Ibadi grinned. I hope. Khaled came back with their passports. All done. And now? He pointed to a small plane waiting on the tarmac. We're not staying, Rachel grimaced. It's so nice here. No. Khaled spoke quickly to one of his security team, who nodded and went to a carry-all bag and removed a small black handgun in a black holster. He handed it to Khaled. The Saudi Arabian checked it, and then handed it to Rachel. I assume you didn't bring a weapon. You know I didn't. She took the gun, half pulling it from the holster. Nice. Glock 17. Reliable, lightweight, and a 17-round mag. This'll do just fine. She tucked it down the back of her pants. Expecting trouble? Here you must always expect trouble. The wide desert country has marauding bandits, terrorists, and opportunists, but they are spread far and wide. Worse to stay in the city, where you can get your throat cut just for taking a wrong turn. So where to? Joshua asked. Salal, Khaled said. He looked up at the sun and pointed northeast. About 250 miles that way. Take us a few hours to get there by small plane. It's the closest settlement to where our map seems to point. Or ends, Rachel said. I know the area, Ebadi said. Dry, very dry. The terrain of this country is dominated by the low-lying Chad Basin. And that basin was once the bottom of an inland sea, Matt said. And why we're here. How far is it from Lake Chad now? To the water's edge around three hundred miles, less in the rainy season when the lakes double in size. But the important thing is where Salal is now. Only a few thousand years ago, it was all underwater. A good place to start, then, Joshua said. Khaled had his security team transport their gear and Mrs. Van Helling to the smaller plane. Going to be cramped, Matt said to Rachel, who watched with compressed lips. It already is, she said softly. Well, we're not here on holiday, 
and look at the upside. At least you're packing heat again. Matt grinned. Khaled led them to a twin-prop plane that was roughly the same size as the jet, but from a vastly different era. Its nose and wing shoulders were bug-splattered, and oil stains streaked its sides. That's our ride? Rachel groaned. Khaled grinned. Commander Aero 680, built in 1968 and still running, just. Not many around now, and I'm betting this one is held together with twine and black magic. This time their flight was noisy, cramped, and if there was once air conditioning, it was either turned off to conserve fuel or had stopped working decades before. Matt spent his time looking down on a dry, featureless landscape. Chad was one of the larger African countries, and more than three times the size of California. Thankfully, their trip was short, and in no time they were dropping fast toward a long, flat, dusty track. The airport, Matt assumed. The pilot then lined the Aero 680 up, and they came down hard, bouncing, slewing to the left and then overcompensating to the right. Matt thought he heard laughter coming from the cockpit. Matt would have pulled his belt a little tighter, but there wasn't one, so he just sat back in his chair and clamped his teeth. The plane finally straightened and slowed. Matt ducked to look from the window, and saw a couple of goats scampering away from the plane as it careered down the dirt runway. He dragged out his backpack. His shirt hung slack against his chest, already soaked in perspiration. He felt a weird sensation in his gut and put a hand on his stomach. It was a strange coiling and twisting, not so unpleasant, more like a bad case of butterflies except a dozen times worse. He licked his lips again, parched, and drew forth his canteen and sipped. It quenched his thirst, but didn't satisfy him. The door was pushed open, and a cloud of dust and several bush flies entered in a rush. Things the size of his thumb belted around the cabin. Matt hunched his shoulders. He knew there were large, biting bush flies, locusts, praying mantis as long as his hand, and also a delightful thing called a flying scorpion. It didn't really fly, but instead had a flattened body that allowed it to be picked up by the wind so it could glide to attack. Thankfully, it wasn't deadly, but had a sting that would bring more than a few tears to your eyes. He turned his collar up, pulled his hat down, and headed for the door behind Rachel. He brushed a huge fly from her shoulder, and it took exception to his attack and flew straight at his face. Matt clamped his mouth shut, and it bounced harmlessly from his cheek to zoom lazily away, searching for something else of interest in the rear of the plane. Eleanor Van Helling, he bet. There was one thing that excited insects out in the bush, and one thing he remembered Oscar Ojibwe warning them never to wear, perfume, and the old woman was drenched in it. Three covered army jeeps bumbled out from a low, squat building and roared to a stop close by. Khaled waved and jogged toward them. A tall man the color of mahogany stepped out of the lead jeep. He wore an iron-gray uniform and black beret, and mirror glasses with a cigarette dangling casually from his lips. He sauntered toward them. The man flicked the smoke away, saluted, and then reached out to shake Khaled's hand. Straight after, just like in the airport, the Saudi handed the man a thick envelope that the officer opened and peered inside. Satisfied, he slid it into his shirt and clicked his fingers for the other drivers to step out and load luggage. Khaled gathered the group together. Captain Abdullah Okembu has given us these drivers who will take us out to the geographic point we wish to go to. He grinned. He said there's nothing out there but sand, dust, and giant bushflies. They think we're all crazy. 
He grinned. I think he's right. Joshua turned to the group. Has everyone taken their medications? I'm practically rattling, Matt said. They make me sick, Eleanor added. Joshua scrutinized her for a moment. Mrs. Van Helling, what will make you sick is avoiding your anti-parasitics and getting bitten by something like a local deer fly. They carry a particularly nasty creature called the Loa Loa filariasis, also affectionately known as the African eye worm. He held his hand up, inching his finger along in the air. As a nymph, it makes its way to the tissue of your eye. Once there, it feeds and grows. And when it's large enough to be observed moving just below the surface of the eyeball, usually the only way to get it out is through total removal of the eye. Goddamn hellhole, she muttered. Sorry you came. Rachel's mouth curved into a smile. Eleanor's lip curled. Don't try and tell me you're happy to be here, girlie. At least I've been to places like this before. I'll wager the farthest you've been is Central Park. Boom! Matt grinned at Rachel, who turned gritted teeth on him. The joys of a family field trip, Matt thought, and looked over his shoulder at Eleanor. Tough old buzzard, he thought. Khaled chatted briefly with his commandos. They all seemed to know Khaled well, and they shared a few jokes before he separated them all into three groups. Himself, Matt, Rachel, and one security team member named Saib. The next jeep would hold Eleanor, Greta, Ibadi, and a second security team member named Rizwan. And the final jeep would just hold Joshua, Zahil, and Yasha, the last two security guys, as well as most of their luggage. Matt headed to the lead jeep and jumped in next to the driver. Khaled slid into the back and Rachel beside him, and the blocky commando, Saeed, sat in a sort of rumble seat at the rear. Captain Okembu stood with folded arms watching them load up. Even though the man wore mirrored sunglasses, Matt felt his eyes on them, scrutinizing their every move. Matt turned to the driver and greeted the man in Arabic. The driver gave him an insolent nod and turned back to the windshield. Oh well, he thought. We're not here to make friends. He turned in his seat. How long? Khaled shrugged. Just a few hours, but better to ask him. He knows the terrain better than I do. Matt looked at the man again and sucked in a breath. Okay, how long until we are at our destination? The driver looked at him, his eyes still half-lidded, and the whites of his eyes yellow from being in proximity to an open fire one too many times. There were also tribal scars on his temples, and Matt bet there were more hidden under his cap. He fished a crumpled packet of cigarettes from his pocket, stuck one in his mouth, and then lit it with a plastic lighter. He blew thick smoke at the dashboard, and then casually looked at an enormous fake Rolex on his wrist. Two hours, maybe little more. Thank you, very helpful, Matt responded in Arabic. The driver scrutinized him for a few moments, taking in the long sandy hair and blue eyes. You speak Arabic well, but you are not an Arab. I'm a teacher of languages, Matt said. The driver blew more smoke and turned his yellow eyes on Matt again. You should not go there. He spat out some tobacco. Why does a teacher need to drive out into the middle of our country during the dry season? What do you think is out there that requires a language teacher? Matt turned back to the windscreen. Maybe nothing but a legend. The man grunted. Then this is the country for that. My name is Professor Matthew Kearns. What do they call you? Matt kept watching him. The man's lips pursed for a second, 
as he decided whether to reveal his name or not. He shrugged. Mohammed Asalem. Nice to meet you, Mohammed. Matt examined the shining dark face. I have a question for you. What do you think is out there? He smirked and then blew more smoke. Bones. Nothing but bones, dust, and death, until the end of the world. I see. Matt twisted in his seat to check on the other vehicles. Everyone and everything was loaded up except for Captain Okimbu. The tall man slowly scanned the horizon, and then seemed to make a decision. He climbed in next to Joshua. Okembu then banged a hand on the side of the jeep, and the three engines started in unison. Matt turned back to Muhammad. If there's nothing but bones, then why has your captain decided to come with us? Muhammad looked over his shoulder, and then his eyes briefly flicked to Matt. Maybe he thinks you know something. He then put the jeep in gear and stamped on the accelerator. The vehicle lurched forward, throwing them all back into their seats. Matt was glad he was in the lead vehicle, as behind there was a huge plume of dust being kicked up. Beside the dirt track that doubled as a road, there were skinny children with feet so dusty they looked to be wearing long, pale socks. Matt waved, and the children stared back at him as if he were an alien from outer space. Don't think they get a lot of visitors, he guessed. A dog that was all ribs belted out to chase them for a few hundred feet, yapping and looking like it wanted to try and take a bite out of one of the tires. Matt leaned out of the open window. Give it up, buddy. You wouldn't know what to do with it even if you caught it. Rachel laughed as the dog peeled away, its thin chest heaving as it was rapidly left behind. From time to time their driver would flick on the windscreen wipers to dislodge the remains of a bug that had taken a kamikaze run at them and come off second best. The blobs of green, orange, and ochre stuck like syrup, and more often than not the shattered remains of the insect glued to the wipers and smeared into greasy stripes. Once off the road and beyond the borders of shanty shacks, the three jeeps were able to drive in a V formation, and Matt settled into the cracked vinyl of his seat. Even though the terrain was flat, it still made for a spine-jarring race across the plain. In another hour, Matt felt his lips beginning to scale from the dry air. He felt by now they were in the middle of nowhere, in the back of beyond, in the vast, dusty deserts of Chad. In the distance, a pale pink range of mountains began to appear out of the shimmering heat, not high at only about two thousand feet, but steep, sheer faces of craggy rock that looked more like rows of teeth. The hulk of a tank sat rusting to one side and a bird, probably some type of vulture, perched on its bent gun barrel, watching them from one gimlet eye. Matt wondered whether it would follow them, hoping at least one of their soft, pale bodies would be thrown by the wayside. He turned in his seat, leaning one arm on the backrest. Rachel looked pained, and Khaled was studying a computer tablet, trying to hold it steady in the bucking jeep. He noticed Matt watching him and turned the tablet around. He tapped it and showed a GPS feed with a dot as their destination, and an orange line moving toward it, them. He pointed to a numbered bar. Another fifty miles, give or take. Matt nodded and turned back. Conversations in the roaring jeep had to be shouted, and neither of them had the energy or interest right now. Matt lazily watched the small, dry shrubs and spikes of exposed rock or termite mounds pass by. It was unchanging and almost hypnotic, and if it weren't for the occasional drift of loose sand or pothole, he would have dozed regardless of the jerking of the open vehicle. In just over an hour, 
Mohammed started to slow the jeep. Matt took off his sunglasses and wiped his face with a sleeve before sitting forward. There were piles of jagged rock, like stalagmites one would expect to see rising from a cave floor, but standing like sentinels in a landscape that was dusty, dry, and seemingly devoid of life. Mohammed looked in the rear view and then slowed. The captain wants to stop, so we stop. Khaled got out and stood by the jeep, field glasses to his eyes, and slowly scanning a shimmering horizon. Anything? Rachel asked, hands on hips. There's a clay pan basin, and according to my GPS, we will hit the dead center of our mysterious destination within a few miles. He lowered the glasses. Out there. Matt had both hands up over his eyes as he looked at the landscape. The basin looked slightly sunken, but hellishly hot and dry. The fact was, if their cars broke down or the drivers decided to simply leave them behind, they'd probably all die long before they made it even halfway back. In the distance there was still a line of mountains that looked blisteringly scorched by millions of years of brutal sunshine. Abdul Ebadi joined them by the car. This place is old. Geologically, there are only a few places on Earth like this that are not subject to earthquakes due to being so far from fault lines, usually because they're in the center of large, old continents like Africa and Australia. He sipped from his bottle. The downside is they're usually damned hot and dry. Rachel came and leaned an elbow on Matt's shoulder. Just think of it as one long beach. Yeah, except without the surf at the end. He grinned and rubbed the small of her back without anyone seeing. She winked at him and dropped her arm. Khaled was called apart by Captain Okembu who spoke softly to him for a moment or two. Khaled responded, and it resulted in Okembu raising his voice and furiously shaking his head. Khaled in turn threw up his hands and paced away, stopping and staring out into the basin. Okembu folded his arms for a moment, waiting. But then he whistled and shouted instructions to his drivers, who had been sharing cigarettes. They flicked their cigarettes away and headed back to the jeeps, where they began to unload the luggage. Khaled spun. Okay, okay. Okembu and Khaled talked a little more, and then the Chad captain sauntered back to the rear jeep. Khaled joined them, sighing. Trouble? Rachel asked. Captain Okembu decided this was the time to tell me that this area is taboo for his men, Khaled snorted. Taboo? That's a good thing. Usually means some myth or legend originated from here. I doubt it. More than likely, he knew we were close, so decided this was the best time to hold out for more money. He almost snarled. It worked. How much more? Ebadi asked. Ten thousand for him and another thousand for each of the drivers. Ebadi whistled. An expensive extra few miles. Not if you have to walk back, Matt observed. Well then, let us see what we see, Khaled said, before the price goes up again. They loaded back into the aging jeeps, and Khaled banged its metal side. Mohammed took off again across the plain. Sand drifts made the going slow, and a wind had kicked up that buffeted the open jeep and sucked the moisture from Matt's nose and eyes. He was glad he was wearing sunglasses, not just to keep down the blinding glare, but also to act as shield against the hard particles that plinked on their lenses. Khaled tapped the driver's seat back. Slow. Mohammed eased back and they ground along at about ten miles per hour. Matt could see nothing but miles of sand, the remains of an occasional shrub 
that had long since returned to its maker, and the constant line of the jagged pink mountains a few miles to their north. Stop! The jeep eased to a halt. Khaled lowered his tablet and looked around. We're here. The dust settled, and they all sat in silence, staring out at the dead landscape. Nothing, Rachel whispered. Khaled was the first out, then Matt, Rachel, and Saib. In another few seconds the entire group was out, crowding around the lead jeep, and only Eleanor remained in her vehicle. Greta had been sent forward to listen. Well, this is it, Khaled said. This is where your map has brought us, Professor. Matt breathed in and out slowly through his nose, feeling like it was being singed to hairlessness by the oven-hot winds. Spread out, look around, he said. Look for something, anything, that could give us an indication of— Matt stopped. He didn't even know himself exactly what they were looking for. Some sort of human interaction. Gives a clue, like what? Rachel asked. Matt hiked his shoulders. I don't know. I guess you might know it when you see it. Right. Rachel jammed her hands in her pockets and meandered off. She kicked a stone ship twenty feet out into a sand drift. Anyone spot a big wooden boat, call the professor. She grinned back over his shoulder. Thank you, ma'am. Matt touched the brim of his cap. The group spread out, ambling off in different directions. Captain Okembu and his drivers slouched against the jeeps, smoking and laughing. Matt could guess at what. Here were a bunch of Westerners and a few Arabs, wandering in a sandy desert with nothing but scorpions, big bugs, and a few hardy reptiles for company. He could almost laugh himself. Matt stopped and lifted his cap to wipe sweat from his brow. Down this low, the heat was near unbearable, and there wasn't even high ground he could use to survey the area, and the mountains were too far off to be of use. He set off again, shuffling along, pausing to stop at rocks or indentations in the sand and grit. From time to time he'd look up and see members of his group now spread in all directions. The figure of Rachel was several hundred yards away and shimmering in the heat. He watched her as she meandered out, and then turned to wander back, kicking small stones as she came. Something the size of his thumb landed on his neck, stuck and began to dig in. Fuck off! He brushed it away, and it relaunched itself to zoom away probably looking for another dripping body to feed off. Rock, Joshua said, lifting a flat stone the size of a hubcap and tossing it aside. Matt snorted and sat down on a stone. Nothing but sand, rocks, and big damned bugs, he thought miserably. He sipped from his canteen, the water now the temperature of blood. Myths and legends always have a kernel of truth, he always said. He sipped again, swirled the warm liquid around in his mouth, and spat onto the sand. Except for the times they don't. Chapter 15 Another rock, Rachel chuckled as she flipped a slab of stone over. Matt groaned to his feet. Come on, guys. We just flew halfway around the world to be here. Take it fucking seriously, he thought. He stepped up on the rock he had sat on. It was about the size of a small manhole cover. He kicked at it, noticing how smooth it was. Water smoothed, he bet. He was about to step off when an eye trained for decades to pick out the most indistinct markings made by human hands stopped him. Hey. He crouched beside it and used a hand to wipe the sand from its surface. 
The stone was about three inches thick and rounded at the edges. There were definite markings on the sides. They weren't in a language he could recognize, but instead just trailing away at the edges. Matt stared. Hundreds or thousands of years ago, there might have been a settlement here. He knew that stones were used to sharpen iron and bronze blades for centuries. But something about these didn't strike him as being random cuts. He cleared more sand from all the outer edges. The markings were only on one-third of the stone, and just at its sides. He gritted his teeth and flipped it over. There was nothing on its underside, and he flipped it back. Hey, wait a minute. Abdul Ebadi had been watching him and now jogged over. He crouched by Matt. Hold that stone up again. Matt did as he was asked, and Ebadi grabbed it, holding it in place. He ran his fingers over the smooth edges, stopping to trace the odd markings at its sides. I've seen something like this before. There were ancient stone pillars found on a mountaintop in South Korea. They were called Jiang Seung and were used as message boards, or to give warnings. He looked around. Good, there's more. Ebadi dragged another smaller one closer. You see, when they were first discovered on the mountain, they were all in pieces. Like this one? Matt asked. Not sure this is like that. But putting the Jiang Seung puzzle back together was quite simple as long as the archaeologists followed the patterns on their outer edges. The stones are both the puzzle and the key. Matt rubbed his hands together. Exactly. Ebadi grinned and stood quickly. Everyone, over here! It's the stones! The group jogged back to Matt and Ebadi. Even the drivers and Captain Okembu walked slowly toward them obviously not wanting to betray their cool. Ebadi pointed. These stones probably form some sort of structure. I believe they're like a message totem, but the message is on the outside and can only be read in its entirety. We need to try and rebuild it to see if the message is still there. Khaled looked around, kicking at a stone the size of a hubcap. So we just gather the stones, bring them to you? Some are pretty big. No, just locate them first. We need to rebuild the totem exactly where it once stood, in case they have astral or geological markers. Their position will be a critical part of the message. Ebadi stood and brushed off his hands, and made a shape in the air as he talked. I believe it will form some sort of tapering column when reconstructed. The biggest will be on the bottom, so try and find a large, flat base. The largest one we find will dictate where we try and reassemble it. The group formed a ring and started to move outwards. When they found a piece, they'd mark its position and move on. Yo, big sucker here. Rachel tried to get her fingertips under the huge stone. Too big to even budge. Matt joined her and knelt to brush the stone down. It was about six feet around. Excellent. This might be the base. He rubbed at its edges, feeling the lines and swirls. Even with his vast language skills, the squiggles meant nothing to him. Another one. Big. Joshua held up a hand. Ebadi went from Rachel's stone to Joshua's, looking back from one to the other. Rachel's is biggest, so we'll start from there. What happens if we find another bigger one? Khaled asked. Ebadi spread his arms wide. Then we start over. He walked around Joshua's stone. Step one, we need to get this stone over on top of that one. We'll need several of us to carry it, and... He turned to Captain Okembu. And can you lend a hand here, Captain? 
Okembu took a dry twig from his mouth he had been chewing. My men can help, but you must pay them. You hired them as drivers, not laborers. He grinned, his white teeth showing. Khaled snorted. And they have proved to be the most capable drivers in Chad, and the most expensive. He planted his legs. A hundred dollars apiece. Okembu didn't flinch. One thousand, and another thousand for the supervisor, me. Khaled snorted. Two fifty, last offer. Seven fifty. Okembu stood straighter. Khaled flicked his hand. Forget it. Go and wait in your cars. Okembu stared for a few seconds, his grin fading. He turned on his heel and clicked his fingers. He and his three men sauntered back to their jeeps. Matt watched them for a moment. Please tell me that you didn't pay all their driving fee up front. Not a chance. Khaled turned away from watching the men. Only a small advance and the bulk when we make it back. We Arabs know a thing or two about negotiation. Khaled waved in his security men. Saib, Rizwan, and Zahil lent a hand, and Yasha stayed on watch. Good. Matt turned to the older archaeology professor. Professor Ibadi, you supervise. We'll carry the stones, but you'll have to tell us where to lay them. Joshua also lent a hand. His second-largest flat stone was extremely heavy, and together the group grunted and strained to lift it. But even together, they only managed to get it about a foot off the ground. Damn, we're going to have to drag it, Joshua said. Not ideal, Ibadi said. It would be best if we didn't disturb the surrounding earth with drag furrows. Try again. Greta came over and wedged herself in beside two of Khaled's security men. She gripped the stone, waiting. Okay, then. Matt smiled. On three, two, one, lift. Greta strained, and Matt saw her forearms flex. The woman's fingers were large and blunt, and this time the stone lifted. Matt had heard of strong women before. In Nebraska there was Becca Swanson, an American powerlifter and wrestler, who could deadlift 680 pounds and squat 850. He bet that Greta would have given her a run for her money. This time they managed to carry the large flat stone, the 50 feet, to hold it over Rachel's tabletop-sized piece. Easy. Ibadi crab-walked around them. Okay, turn about twenty degrees east. Slow, easy, and... Now, lay it down there gently. Together they eased it down into place. Ibadi walked around it, nodding. Good, that will do. He looked up. Now to find the rest, and we must find them all to complete the message. I'm guessing we're looking for the next largest, Rachel said. You got it, Matt said, all tapering toward the top. They were lucky. The remaining stones were all found spread over a cone-shaped area, stretching out to the west. Some were in pieces and had to be reassembled, but luckily the fragments were close by. The reassembling work took time and care and often the stones had to be turned, refitted, and then returned to ensure all the symbols lined up. At least the work got easier as the stones got smaller toward the top. After several hours sweat-filled, draining but rewarding labor, Matt stepped back to admire their work. Ta-da! Joshua stretched his back and then removed his hat to wipe his brow. Well, we've sure got something. I'm not sure what, though. It was a tapering column of dark stone, six feet around at the base, just over that again in height, and with a fist-sized flat stone on top. 
It might have held a capping stone at one time, but that was now long gone. I expected a crucifix or something a little more biblical, Rachel said. This looks more like cave art. This was erected thousands of years before a holy man was supposed to have ever been nailed to a cross, Ibadi said, and long before the Christian religion was even born. Matt stepped back, narrowing his eyes. I've seen this before. He turned to Rachel. We both have. Remember the stained glass held an image of a pile of stones? Rachel gave him a blank look, and then slowly shook her head. It was there. I thought at the time it might have been a statue that people were kneeling before. He turned back to the stones. But now I think it was more likely to have been this. A body walked around it. Definitely a marker or signpost, but the symbolism or writing is unknown to me. I can't read it. Let me have a look. Matt squinted and stepped in closer. He ran a hand down along the stones. It fit together almost perfectly, and a few thousand years ago it might have been as smooth as polished marble. He walked around the tapering stone column. Khaled spoke softly as he passed. It looks like the inscriptions we saw on the sarcophagus in the mountain. That's because they are Chaldaic. Matt squatted, his eyes narrowing, as he concentrated on the ancient language. There were areas that had been totally worn away, and he tried to mentally fill in the gaps with what would logically be inserted there. So that's Chaldaic. I'd only ever heard about it. Spoken by Adam and Eve, Ebadi said reverently. And Noah. Read it if you can, Matt. Out loud, please. Just like the stained glass, it refers to the first house of Noach, Noah. Matt ran his hand down along the stone's edges. Here lies Ekebulan. He turned to them, grinning. The real Garden of Eden. Ebadi grinned back. It was here. It was really here. He turned around looking out at the dry desolation of the Chadian desert. Once. Yes and no. Here, but not here. Matt read some more. The wording infers it was a secret place even then. Noah's hidden place. Perhaps somewhere that just he and his family knew about. He looked again at the ancient writing. It uses the Chaldaic word for gate or doorway, or at least some sort of entranceway. Matt stood back. It's not here, but somewhere close. There's a clue. He put a hand up to shield his eyes, turning about. Five thousand steps between where the servant of mankind rises and falls. Matt rubbed his head. Who the hell is the servant of mankind? Shemesh, Ibadi said softly. The son was referred to as Shemesh, the one who serves, or... He smiled. The servant of mankind. Matt pointed one arm east. Where the sun rises, then his other arm west. And where the sun falls, he lowered them. So that means we have a choice, north or south. North, Khaled said. I would estimate that range of mountains is about 5,000 steps. He lifted his field glasses, scanning slowly. And you said it referred to a doorway or gate. Well, I can see there are plenty of caves along its base. Maybe inside one of those. Captain Okembu had sidled up behind them, and now loitered and listened. Khaled turned to him. Captain, do you know those caves? His eyes narrowed. 
You should not go there. They are haram now. Taboo. He shrugged, and his lips turned down. Nothing there anyway. They've all been explored, and are now smugglers' caves. Sometimes camel herders will use them as shelter. Nothing. Don't worry, you'll be safe with us, Rachel said. The Chad captain bristled at the woman's words. Well, we're here, so let's satisfy our curiosity. Five thousand paces, or five minutes by jeep. Khaled lifted his chin to Akembu, who in turn shrugged, and then waved a hand and whistled. The three jeeps immediately started up and rolled toward them. Okembu turned back to them. Only a few hours until the sun will be going down soon. We will not make it back to town. Maybe we will need to stay here. Then let's get moving. Matt waved Rachel into the first jeep with Khaled and Saib. Mohammed waited. Where to? Matt peered along the distant pink mountains. For now, directly to the mountains, and hopefully something will become clear when we get closer. Mohammed stamped on the accelerator, and the jeep's wheels spun in the sand momentarily before jumping forward and pressing the group back into their seats. The three vehicles increased speed the closer they got to the mountains. The ground under their wheels was becoming more hard-packed as it turned from sand drifts to clay pan. Matt tried to imagine what it would have been like all those millennia ago. Lush forests, with the flora perhaps climbing the sides of the mountains as well. The noise of birds in the trees, and herds of animals on the fertile plains. And then before that, perhaps this entire area was under deep blue water, an inland sea, also teeming with water life. Matt hung from the jeep window and looked along the edifice. Caves pocked the prehistoric-looking mountain faces, some at ground level and some higher up. There were too many to choose from. He laid a hand on Mohammed's forearm. Slow down. The driver threw an arm out the window and held a hand up flat in the air. He eased down, and the following vehicles did the same. The convoy then bundled along at just a few miles per hour. Matt held out a hand to Khaled. Lend me your field glasses. Khaled handed him the powerful lenses, and Matt lifted them to his eyes. He scanned the caves. Some were little more than shallow dens, and some large openings that vanished into endless voids. He exhaled. Too many. They were now only several hundred feet from the sheer wall, and Matt called a halt. We need to look closer. Nose to wall, I'm afraid. The vehicles all lined up, and the group got out. Rachel walked forward and stood with her hands on her hips. What are we looking for? Matt scanned the sheer cliff face. Caldaic script would be great, but anything that looks like it might be related. Hell, just see if we can see any indication that one of the caves is the one we seek. Let's split up, Khaled said. Three teams will cover more ground. Good idea, Matt said. We'll take this big cave right here. Remember, we're looking for writings, symbols, even evidence of ancient habitation. And yell if you find anything before exploring it. That'll save us other saps a lot of wasted energy exploring wrong caves. Professor Kearns. Matt turned at the voice. Greta marched toward him and smiled with thin-lipped formality. When we find the correct cave, we'll bring in Mrs. Van Helling, yes? Matt shrugged. Yes, yeah, sure, why not? But we can only take her so far. I don't think it'd be a good idea to try and wedge the old girl into some tiny cave. The old girl will manage, she craned towards him. That's why I'm here. The ice in Greta's words made Matt gulp. 
She marched back to her own group. Matt shook his head. Jesus. He then looked again along the line of multiple cave mouths. One more thing, he thought. And mark the entrances of the caves you've already searched. An X will do. He turned and noticed the three drivers watching Captain Okembu as he stood on the hood of one of the jeeps, field glasses to his eyes, slowly scanning the desert. What's he doing? Matt asked Khaled. I think keeping watch for pirates, terrorists, bandits, you name it. Around here, strangers might mean an opportunity for fast cash or goods. Oh boy, Matt said. Don't worry, between Okembu and his men, and my commandos, we've got plenty of firepower. Khaled turned back to the caves. But best we get our work done, and not stay longer than we need to. I hear that. Matt waved the groups to the cliff face. They split up the closest twenty caves between them. Khaled, Matt, Rachel, and Saib went into one of the first, the largest, about ten feet high and double that in width. It opened out just inside and was at least dry and cool. Matt took off his cap and pushed long, wet hair off his face. That's better. If nothing else, this will be where we camp tonight. As long as the owners of that old campfire don't return, Khaled pointed at the remains of a fire pit. Rachel knelt beside it and lifted a piece of the charcoal. She sniffed it. Hasn't been used for weeks or maybe months. Matt fished out a small, powerful maglite and flicked it on. Rachel and Khaled did the same. The Saudi turned little more than local graffiti, a rude joke written in Arabic, probably by one of the recent occupiers of the cave. Further in, there were faded images on the walls that depicted long-legged birds, antelope, and something that might have even been a bear. Matt rested his hands on his hips. This is more like it. Some of the cave art in this area dates back 10,000 to 12,000 years. This place was a forest then. They spent another twenty minutes examining the interior, but at the absolute rear, there was a blank wall. It ends here, Rachel said, and shone her light up at the ceiling. And there hasn't been a cave-in to close any further passages off. Yeah, this one is a no-go, Matt said. Let's keep moving while we've got some daylight outside. He led them to their next cave. After several more hours, the groups convened in the light of a setting sun, looking dispirited. Joshua rolled his shoulders and winced. You know what crossed my mind after finding nothing in that last cave? Everyone waited. That we might have put the totem pole up facing the wrong way, he grimaced. Khaled laughed, but then turned to Matt, then Ebadi. Please tell me this is not a possibility. Matt felt his stomach sink. Well, it might. No, Ebadi said emphatically. In archaeology, we need to reconstruct artifacts and structures many times. And in some cases, we will only have parts, or only fragments of the initial structure to work with. He looked to where the sun was rapidly approaching the horizon. The great thing about sunshine is it is so powerful, and it always rises and sets in the same area. After hundreds or even better thousands of years, you will get greater bleaching on the side of an object that faces the sun. He turned square on to Khaled. The totem was reconstructed correctly. Good, Rachel said. So now what? Ah, well, these mountains run for hundreds of miles, so I'm betting there are many more caves to check. Matt rubbed the back of his neck. We could be here weeks. Years, Ebadi said softly. 
But this is where the totem pointed. He placed hands on his large hips and stared at the ground. What did we miss? Yeah, I've got to agree. This feels like the right place, Matt said. Maybe right place, but wrong time, Rachel added. Matt nodded, letting his mind work. He walked backwards, looking up at the sheer mountain face. This particular one only rose about 3,000 feet, but it was like a giant tooth rising from the desert floor. Right place, wrong time, he repeated. The wrong time! He began to laugh. What is it? Ibadi asked, walking to his side. The wrong time! That's it! Matt grinned and spun to Rachel. You're brilliant! You're welcome, Rachel said, raising her chin. And I'm brilliant because... He turned to Khaled. Remember what you said when we first met, that if what we seek is in the past, then that's where we must look. Khaled tilted his head. I remember, for the map. Matt clapped his hands once, loudly. Then that's what we should be doing here. We're looking for clues based on today's landscape. But when Noah was supposedly here, what was happening? What was it like? Matt held his arms wide. He wasn't here at all. Ebadi slapped his large thigh. He wasn't here because he was riding an ark, high on an inland sea. Matt pointed at Ibadi's chest. Damned right. This whole area would have been underwater, perhaps under hundreds of feet of water. He craned his neck and began to back up. If there are going to be any clues, they'd be up there. He pointed. Khaled already had his field glasses to his eyes. Yes, about 250, 260 feet up. There's a cave, a big one. Matt felt his heart leap in his chest, but tried to remain calm. Then, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we need to be. Chapter 16 they have commandos with them, and the vehicles are guarded. Aetius stayed low to the ground. Right. Drusus scanned the cliff wall, and then the figures assembling before it. He handed the miniaturized scope lens back to Aetius. Three Chad National Army soldiers are guarding their jeeps. First, let's stop them getting away. Once they're on the wall, they have nowhere to go. No mistakes this time. He loses patience with us. He turned and made a few quick hand signals, and immediately several of the men started to slither along a low ridge to get closer to the jeeps. Chapter 17 I can do it, Joshua said, craning his neck and pushing his glasses back on his nose. I do wall climbing for exercise, and I've scaled cliff faces before. Sometimes you need to get up or down into the weirdest nooks and crannies to search out the most elusive of bugs. We didn't exactly bring climbing gear. We've got old rope, a single flare gun, and luckily plenty of flashlights. But no pitons, carabiners, or even helmets, Rachel said. Long way to fall. So your advice is, don't fall. He turned to wink at her, before turning back to stare upwards, probably working through his possible route. He pushed his spectacles up his nose. It's quite a sheer face, but it has plenty of handholds, and lots of places for me to tie off. It can be done, and 250 feet is not a long way. Should we wait until morning? Ebadi asked. The sun was now a huge orange ball heading toward the horizon, and the shadows were lengthening. We've only got a few hours at best. Won't take me long to secure guide ropes, Joshua said. And if it is a cave, 
Then it'll be dark inside, whether it's night or day, right? Then we all go, Khaled said. Each of the group members agreed, and even Ebadi sighed but nodded. They piled all the rope they had from the jeeps at Joshua's feet. He squatted over it, checking its strength. This will do. I'll tie off at the first junction. He pointed. That jutting rock. Then move to the next, leaving the ropes as a ladder. Once we have a few of Khaled's men up there, they can help pull the rest of us further up. Rachel nodded. Might work. Matt turned to Greta, who had finally brought the old woman from the jeep. Not everyone needs to climb up. It might be all for nothing. This is it, Eleanor said without looking at him. We're coming. The old woman's cold blue eyes were like flint chips, and he saw that Greta's jaw was also set. The big woman reached forward to smooth Eleanor's thin hair down. But if her body was failing, her eyes were electric in their intensity. Matt sighed. At least she wouldn't be hard to pull up, he thought. Khaled organized them into climbing pairs. He pointed to two of his men. Saib, Rizwan, you two will scale next. One to assist the climbers, the other to act as a lookout. Then Professor Kearns and Agent Bromelow. After that, Professor Abadi and myself. Once we ascertain it is safe, then Mrs. Van Helling and her nurse can ascend. Greta's eyes narrowed, but she stayed silent. Khaled pointed to his second-to-last man. Zahil? You will help the women climb. He then moved to his final commando. And Yasha, my brother, you will secure our base. He looked across to Captain Okembu, who loitered at the jeeps, but pushed off to walk toward them. Khaled lowered his voice. Make sure our ride home doesn't decide to leave without us. Khaled then spoke softly in Arabic to the commando, but Matt understood every word. We need the jeeps, not the men. If they try and leave, you know what to do. The commando nodded, and his eyes slid to the three drivers. Captain Okembu took the twig from his mouth and looked up at the cave, and then to Matt. So, Professor, you are going up. Matt nodded. Yep. Policewoman is going up? Mr. Khaled and old rich lady? Then I will too. You will need my protection. He grinned. No charge. No, I think you should stay down here, Khaled said. Your job is to organize our ride. My job is to keep you all alive. His grin widened. But it is also to safeguard the property of the Chadian government. Matt groaned. Seriously? Now you're getting all patriotic? This was going to get expensive, he thought. I assure you, any artifacts we find will be handed over. You have my word. Khaled held his ground, and his four commandos all became a little more alert. Matt could feel the tension rising. Captain Okembu looked long and hard at each of them. Yes, you can kill me, or perhaps try, and you will need to kill all of us. But when, or if, you get back to Unjamena Airport, you will have an interesting time explaining what happened to us. He smirked. Our prisons are not very pleasant for those who enjoy Western luxuries. His eyes slid to Rachel and then Eleanor Van Helling. Khaled glared. And you'll still be bones. Matt sighed. Let him come. Sheesh, this is getting way too complicated. Wise choice, Professor. That's why I like you. Okembu turned to Joshua. 
Better get moving, Spectacle Man, before the light is gone for good, yes? Spectacle Man? Joshua snorted and began to loop the coils of rope over each of his shoulders and another few loops around his waist. He sucked in a breath and reached up for the first handhold. Wait. Khaled walked to the man and quickly checked the ropes he had looped around him. He looked deeply into the young man's face. I can see fear. Be calm. He stood back a step. Good luck, Dr. Gideon. Joshua nodded and shook his hand. Thanks. He turned back to the rock face, bounced for a moment on his toes, before leaping and grabbing a small ridge. He levered himself up from the ground. And he's off, Rachel said softly. Holy shit. Matt had a whole new level of respect for the skinny young doctor of parasitology as he climbed deftly, moving like a crab across a tidal rock, never once looking back, ever looking upwards or across to his next handhold. In a few minutes he was a good eighty feet up and onto an outcrop with a jagged rock jutting up like a huge dagger. He wedged himself in behind it, threw a loop of rope around the outcrop, tied it off, and then dropped it down. Okay, next, Matt said. Both of Khaled's commandos climbed quickly, looking like they had experience. They were much heavier and less agile than Joshua, and dragged themselves up using raw muscle power alone. By the time they reached the rock outcrop, Joshua was already fifty feet further along, on his way to his next island of rest. Let's do this. Matt nodded to Rachel, and then wiped his sweating hands on his pants. He grabbed the rope and tugged on it a few times. Rachel snorted. Matt, if it can hold that pair of beefcakes, then a lightweight like you should be safe. Haven't you heard that muscle weighs more than fat? I'm heavier than I look. He drew in a breath, looking up to the first rest spot. If you fall, try not to hit me on the way down. She nudged him in the back. Get going, Hercules. He pulled himself up. Matt had climbed before and knew to use his legs as much as his arms and shoulders. The toughest bit of the climb was the abrasion on his hands. The rope wasn't the soft, elasticized type favored by modern climbers, but instead an old-style rope that had probably been sitting in the back of the jeep for years. Thankfully, it wasn't long before one of Khaled's two men held out a hand to pull him up the final few feet into the alcove. Good view, Professor, Saib asked. Matt noticed it was the commando from his jeep. The man had largely been silent and invisible. It's Matt. Saib. The man shook his hand briefly. The other, taller man, leaned around him to thrust his own hand out. Rizwan. Matt turned to look out over the scene. Saib was right. It was a magnificent view of the African plain that stretched for miles. In the distance there were a few little dancing dust devils swirling over and around the dry earth, boulder, or stunted shrub. Matt looked up to where Joshua was scaling high above them. So which one of you two gets to go next? Rizwan raised a hand, and then turned to start his second climb along the next rope line that Joshua had strung for them. I got this one. Matt reached down and grabbed Rachel's arm and hauled her up. She came into his arms. Easier than it looks, she said, puffing for a moment. Yeah, right. We're not even halfway yet. Matt looked up but we're doing better than I expected. He looked up and across to where Joshua was approaching his third rest stop. Rizwan was already perched at the second. The human fly is nearly there, 
Let's get across to the second stop before it gets overcrowded here. He looked back over the edge. Ibadi was closing in on where they stood, and Khaled was now on the rope. Standing in line was Greta. She had Eleanor lashed to her shoulders like some sort of grotesque backpack. Behind her, the last two of Khaled's men, Yasha and Zahil, waited their turn, while Captain Okembu stood smoking a thick cigarette. Greta reached up, took hold of the rope, and started to hold herself up, hand over hand. She shrugged off any help from the commando. Matt blew air through his lips. That is one tough wound. Get going. Rachel gave him a push. Matt started up. In another half an hour, he and Rachel were on the next ledge, and now all of them were strung along the face of the cliff wall. He checked his hands. The rough rope had scoured much of the skin off his palms, and they stung like fire. He blew on them. He looked up to see that Joshua had now made it to the cave, tied off his last rope for them to use, and then turned back to give them an enthusiastic thumbs up. Matt waved back. Come on, I've got a good feeling about this. He felt strangely impatient and could feel the buzz of excitement in his stomach. Professional curiosity coupled with something else, an odd feeling of coming home. He took hold of the rope and gripped it tight for a few seconds, before pulling one of his hands back to look at it. What's up? Rachel asked, trying to see over his shoulder. A uh, friction burn. He gripped the rope again. The thing was, his abraded palms weren't abraded anymore. Must have just been rubbed and flushed with blood. He knew he was just bullshitting himself now. Concentrate on the rope, he thought, focusing. The last thing he wanted to do was make a mistake when he was so close. He started up the second-to-last leg. By the time he hauled Rachel up to the third rest stop, they were sweating and puffing hard. He had to lean back and catch his breath, and was glad there was only about fifty more feet to go. Least it'll be easy going down, Rachel said her own back against the wall. She pulled her small canteen from a leg pouch pocket and took a swig. Matt looked down at all the bodies strung out over the wall. That'll be my workout for the day. He rolled his shoulders. Hey, what's that? Rachel frowned as there came several odd popping sounds. The sounds came again and seemed to echo and bounce around from somewhere out on the desert floor. I don't know. He squinted. The next sound was from a ricochet, and stone chips flicked over them. Oh, shit! Gunfire! Rachel said. Get down! I think we've just been found. Matt hunkered down. Bandits. Don't think so. Rachel listened to the gunfire for a second or two more. That sounds like an HK-416 assault rifle. A bit high-tech for your average desert bandit. Doesn't matter. A bullet is a bullet, Matt replied. Yeah, it does. Your average bandits can't shoot for shit. Rachel peered around a column of stone. But these guys... More pops and more shards of stone flying through the air. There came a grunt and yell from below, and Matt leaned out over the edge. One of Khaled's security men tumbled back from the rope and fell like a bag of meat to impact hard on the ground. He didn't move again. I think that was Yasha, Matt breathed. Rachel grabbed him and jerked him back. These guys know what they're doing. Got to be the Borgia. Stay the fuck down. Ah, oh, shit. How did they find us? Matt groaned. For once in my life, I wish it was just Silicon rebels or bandits. Rachel pulled the handgun Khaled had given her and edged forward. 
The popping continued. We've got handguns, and they sound like HK-416s and M4 carbines. We're sitting ducks up here. Where the hell are Okembu's men? Matt carefully lifted his head, and immediately spotted three bodies lying on the sand. Oh, shit, no. Saib, the first of Khaled's commandos, had made it to Joshua's cave, and he immediately threw himself flat and began to return fire. Save your ammunition, buddy, Rachel whispered. Ebadi and Rizwan were closing in on them, and still at the second rest stop, Khaled waited his turn. Just below them, Greta with Eleanor, Zahil and Captain Okembu clambered along the rope, moving fast. Matt guessed everyone had the same idea. They had no option but to keep moving. Something popped and wobbled from the desert floor. It rose to about fifty feet. Then it ignited before shooting directly toward them. Fucking RPG! Rachel grabbed Matt and pulled him down flat. The rocket-propelled grenade quickly accelerated to six hundred feet per second before striking the cliff wall a hundred feet from them. Huge chunks of stone were blasted away, dropping to the desert floor with a shuddering thump. There came another, and another. The next impacted about ten feet above Professor Ibadi and Rizwan. They hugged the cliff wall and tried to merge with the stone. But even though the impact had been above them, a sheet of rock about ten feet square exploded loose and came down like a massive guillotine, wiping both men from the wall as if they were flies on a window pane. It was impossible to tell if either of them screamed. Matt cringed as the rock and human debris crashed into the ground hundreds of feet below, and then was followed by an echo that thumped out across the desert. Those sons of bitches, Rachel hissed. We stay here, we're all dead. She dragged on his arm. What about the others? Matt pointed back down the rock face. We can stand here and fret about it, or we can climb higher and try to give them some cover as they climb. Rachel peeked over the edge. Matt felt like crap leaving the others behind, but knew there was no other serious option. But, but nothing. Get moving. She gave him a shove toward the rope. Matt turned back to see that Khaled was climbing rapidly up to their position. High above them in the cave, Joshua was yelling for them to climb, and Saib was trying to pick his targets down below. It was now or never. Matt edged out, hanging on to the guide rope. For the first time, he was conscious of the height, the breeze, and growing darkness. The back of his neck prickled as if waiting for the bite of a bullet or worse, the slamming impact of a red-hot fragmentation RPG. Rachel was only three feet behind him. Keep going, don't freeze. She hissed the words, breathing heavily herself now. Bullets pinged off the rock nearby, but for the most part their attackers were targeting those lower down, whom they had a better chance of hitting. Don't look down, we're nearly there. Rachel said. Reach up! Matt looked up to see the scientist leaning out with hand outstretched. His face was streaked with dirt and perspiration, and behind his specks his eyes stood out in a flushed face. Matt grabbed his hand, pulled, and then rolled into the cave to lie on his back, puffing hard. Joshua immediately rolled back and grabbed Rachel, who came up fast over the ledge and rolled for cover. After a few seconds, she was up and beside Saib, pointing her gun down at the desert floor. Matt wiped his brow. The moon was rising, and just before he joined Rachel, he saw the moonlight glint on something sticking from the cave edge. He squinted. It was an old metal piton, a climbing spike hammered into the wall. There was more gunfire and Matt rolled over and crawled up beside Rachel. Khaled wasn't far behind, 
He had skipped the rest stop on Matt and Rachel's last perch and kept going toward them. Further back, the rest of the group was pinned down. In another few minutes, Khaled launched himself over the cave edge and rolled beside them. The Saudi wiped his sweating face and leaned back out, cupping his mouth. Zahil, get ready! The man made a fist and nodded, and Khaled turned to Saib. We need to give the rest cover, or they'll be stuck until they're picked off. Miss Brumelow, do you have ammunition left? She nodded. Okay for now. Six still in the mag and a spare clip. Fully loaded and three spare clips, Saib said. Good. We'll try and keep these guys' heads down. On my word, Khaled rolled back. Hold it. A uh, question. Joshua held up a hand. But shouldn't we be going the other way? Once we're all up here, we're still trapped. I counted twenty rifles, Saib said. They've got us outnumbered and outgunned. Climbing down would mean getting shot. Maybe not. They might just take us hostage, negotiate a sail back to our homes. Joshua raised his eyebrows. Not these guys, Matt said. And just ask our three dead drivers how their negotiation sessions went. We've got to get our people higher. Saeed looked through a small special forces scope. We can't defend our base when it's so strung out. He lowered the scope. I don't think any of them have sniper rifles, praise Allah. They have range, but no real targeting. No real targeting, but lots of luck and just as much ammunition. Eventually they'll hit us by accident. Matt ducked again as another bullet smacked into the cliff wall beside them, making his point. Khaled leaned over and yelled to his remaining commando, who was pinned down with Greta, Eleanor, and Captain Okembu. The man gave him a thumbs up. He was ready and waiting on their signal. Khaled, Rachel, and Saib lay flat with guns extended. The Saudi sighted his targets. Ready? Say the word, Rachel breathed. Yes, Saib said, his eyes rock steady. Three, two, one, climb, Khaled yelled, and began to fire at the desert floor. Rachel and Saib did the same and his commando on the last outcrop began to push Greta and the clinging Eleanor toward the rope. While the large woman readied herself, Okembu pushed past them, took the rope, and began to climb. The commando made a snatch for him, but the Chadian army captain moved too quickly. The commando yelled something, but then went back to getting Greta out on the rope, and then he followed. Matt knew that the handguns would have little accuracy at that distance, but all the flying lead should be enough to keep cautious heads down. The group climbed, Okembu coming fast, Greta slower, with the commando backed up behind them. We need to pick our targets. They're going to be a while, Rachel said. Matt pulled Rachel's field glasses from her pocket and scanned the desert. It's working. A few of them have been hit. He blew air through his lips. But I think there's more than twenty. As he spoke, the three jeeps roared away. There go our jeeps, Joshua said. They're retreating? Matt said, after the disappearing vehicles. No, they'll be back, Khaled said. I think they'll be getting reinforcements and supplies. I believe they're going to wait us out. I would. Well, that's just great. No one's climbing down any time soon, Joshua whined. You can climb down any time you wish. Maybe you can check on Yasha or Dr. Ebadi for us. Khaled turned to glare. Joshua dropped his gaze. Yeah, I think that's their plan, Rachel said. A siege. About fifty feet further down and along the rope, Captain Okembu paused, resting momentarily, and Greta caught up to him. 
Amazingly, the large woman simply reached around the Chad Army captain and then kept on climbing. Wow! Matt couldn't believe how powerful the woman was as she moved hand over hand along the rope. Okembu started up again, now only just in front of the trailing commando. The two groups were halfway across the rope when the next round of RPGs impacted against the wall. One too low, the next too high, and the third RPG obliterating the perch they had just left and also the rock the rope had been tied around. The remaining climbers swung free like a giant pendulum, with the two women and two men hanging on tight. Zahil, Khaled's commando, was closest to the blast, and also right at the very end of the rope, so caught the greatest G-force in the swing. He crashed hard into the cliff wall several times in his high-speed arc, he seemed to have damaged one of his arms, and he slipped a dozen feet down the rough rope. Zahil is hurt. Saib had the scope to his eye again. Even without scopes, they could see the blood over his face and shoulder. Being that close to the explosion would have meant flying rock debris would have been like frag shrapnel. The two men, plus Greta with Eleanor on her back, hung on tight as the rope soared back and forth across the sharp edge of their ledge. The fibers of the old rope immediately began to pop and fray. It's not going to hold, Rachel said, and cupped her mouth. Climb! Hurry! Both Greta and Captain Okembu slowly hold themselves up the now vertical rope. The strain must have been unbelievable on already fatigued muscles. Khaled's last commando just hung there and Matt was glad he couldn't see his face, as he knew there might have been pain, maybe fear, or maybe just a calm sense of inevitability. We'll have to go and get him, Matt said. No, Joshua said. The rope can barely hold them all as it is. He grabbed at the rope. We can at least pull them in. But even this proved unworkable, as the weight on the rope made getting their hands underneath it impossible and leaning over the edge invited gunfire. The rope stretched and complained against the ledge, and fibers pinged free to roll back from the main bunch. Jesus, we gotta try and wedge something underneath it to stop it cutting. Matt took off his shirt and tried to jam it underneath the rope when another RPG exploded on the cliff face out to the side of them. Shit! He rolled away as debris rained down on the group. They're getting better, Khaled said, and scrambled back to the edge. Climb, brother! Finding their range, Rachel said evenly. The next one will be right down our throats. She threw herself back out at the edge. Goddamn, get moving! Greta was close now, followed by Okembu. But it wasn't their climbing that would determine their fate, but the rope. More fibers pinged away and it was now only half of what it was before. It's going to break. Saeed grabbed onto it. It's not going to hold them, Joshua yelled. Okembu stared up at them for a moment, and with one hand dug down at his waist to remove a long-bladed knife. He looked down momentarily and saw that Zahil was staring back up at him. In the growing darkness, Matt thought he made out the tiniest of nods from the commando. Captain Okembu looked back up at the group on the ledge, and his eyes met with Matt's for a split second, before his arm and the blade swept down, cutting the rope below them. The stricken commando fell into space. He didn't flail his arms and didn't say a word. He had already known what was coming. Bastard! Khaled aimed down at Captain Okembu and fired, but Rachel knocked his gun up. Forget it. He did what he had to do to save the women, she said fiercely. Khaled's eyes blazed. No, this coward saved himself. Sure did. But what were his options? Wait until the rope snapped and they all died? Or maybe wait until the next RPG blew them all off the wall? She met his furious gaze. 
Khaled showed gritted teeth, and then glared back down at the Chadian captain. I still curse him and all his ancestors. Let's try and pull them in before we all get to meet our ancestors, Matt said. I can get my hand under the rope now. Joshua had wormed his fingers under the fibers. They all grabbed on and hauled, dragging the rope and the swinging climbers up and then over the ledge. Greta knelt for a moment to untie her belt and let Eleanor gently come free. She then held a bottle of water to her lips and let the woman sip. Matt was touched by how gentle the large woman could be. Okembu got to his feet, his eyes steady and challenging. His hand rested on the butt of his gun. I had no choice. He looked along each of their faces, stopping at Khaled's. The Saudi also got to his feet, with the hulking Saib behind him. The man looked more hostile than anyone Matt had ever seen in his life, and he bet murder was on his mind. I had no choice. Okembu's fingers slowly moved down on the gun. We know, Rachel said, stepping between Khaled and Saib. The next RPG blast was so close it blew them all flat. Into the cave, Joshua yelled. They rushed into the mysterious cave, and Matt looked over his shoulder to see two screaming smoke trails darting toward them. Incoming, he yelled the word, and then dived inside the mouth of the cavern and scrambled forward on knees and elbows. The first RPG impacted above them, the second just inside the mouth of their cave. It felt like an earthquake as tons of rock came down in a waterfall of stone. Boulders as big as refrigerators thumped into the cave mouth, and a wall of dust billowed up, just as they were plunged into a Stygian darkness. Drusus held up a hand. It's over. Aetius stood and cradled his rifle. Should we follow them, we can reopen the cave with shaped charges. No, we wait. Drusus narrowed his eyes as he stared up at the collapsed cave, high up on the sheer mountain wall. It's not us they need to fear now. A rock the size of his fist cracked across Matt's forehead, and he saw stars. He rolled into a bowl to protect himself from more blows, and lay there, waiting for the trembling and bouncing stones to finish their mad dance inside the cave. It was several minutes before the first flashlight went on. Is everyone okay? Rachel sat up, moving her light around. Sound off! There was silence as more lights came on. Matt! Khaled! She yelled now. <coughs> Here! From the Saudi. Matt! Matt wiped his eyes and mouth. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. He felt his forehead for the expected gash, or at least huge egg, but there was nothing. Oddly, there was a sensation of movement under the skin, but it quickly went away. Lucky, he told himself, as he picked his shirt up from the cave floor and put it back on. Greta? Eleanor? The voice was faint. Yes, my dear, we're both alive. Captain Okembu and Saib both answered at once. Joshua, where are you? Rachel waited. Several lights panned around, searching for the parasitologist. Shit, where the hell is he? Rachel got to her feet. There was a groan and the sound of rocks sliding. She whipped the light to the source. The man was down with some of the debris covering his legs. Rachel was first to him, and set to pushing off some of the larger stones. Matt and Saib helped him to sit up. His legs and back were scratched, and there was blood seeping through his torn clothing. In the glare of the lights his face was chalk-white, from either the dust or the pain. 
He put his fingertips to his scalp, and they came away red. That fucking hurt. He breathed deeply and then coughed, holding his chest. I think I might have a broken rib or two. He grimaced. Rachel sat back. Well, the good news is, if you can feel pain, you're alive. So there's that. Rachel patted his shoulder. And the bad news? What do we do now? Matt turned his light to the rear of the cave. Joshua, what was back there? The scientist groaned and sat up. I don't know. I only went in a few feet, but didn't have a chance to explore before we were attacked. It keeps going, I think. Might be another way out, Okembu said. Out is unlikely. We're over 250 feet up, and still a few thousand more up to the peak. Joshua rubbed dust from his hair and looked miserable. More than likely it'll dead end, or lead to another portal on the cliff face. Bottom line, we're fucked. No, but you'll be fucked with that lay-down-and-die attitude, mister. Rachel got to her feet. Hey, remember why we came. Matt dusted himself down. This might be the cave that leads to the Garden of Eden. And the wellspring, Eleanor added quietly. Matt turned to the group. People have been here before. Just before we came in, I saw a metal piton hammered into the wall. It was old, but it tells me that someone had been here within the last century. Clarence, I bet, Eleanor said reverently. Might have been. Matt shone his light toward the back of the cave, and the beam stood out starkly in the still drifting dust clouds. We need to see what we've got to deal with. I agree, especially while we still have working flashlights. Khaled stood. Is everyone okay to walk? They all got to their feet, giving Khaled his answer. Greta stood and lifted Eleanor Van Helling into place. Only Joshua needed help standing. The scientist gripped his ribcage. I think we should stay here. Captain Okembu stood rod straight in the darkness. People will come looking for me. Maybe we can dig our way out. The next explosion was muffled, but still rained dust and debris down on their heads. Eleanor squeaked, and everyone froze, waiting. Jesus, Matt said, and turned to the collapsed entrance. Give it a rest, you bastards. We're already buried. He shone his light toward Okembu. I'm thinking digging our way out that way might not be a good idea. Dust still swirled inside the cave, and Matt lifted the front of his T-shirt to cover his mouth and nose. Besides, if anyone does come, all they'll find is a few dead bodies, the jeep's gone, and no sign of us. No reason to think we're stuck in a cave hundreds of feet up a mountainside. Okembu cursed under his breath. Khaled shone his beam toward the back of the cave. It goes on for quite some way, but the dust is hanging in the air. There is not a breath of air movement. Could mean a sealed environment. And maybe not, Matt said. I've been in caves before and you only need to drop down into a new chamber to find air circulation. There's nothing to keep us here, so... Small smile. In fact, you made every single decision all by your greedy self. So I am happy you are now in here. Cool it, Rachel said. We haven't wasted our time, yet. She pointed at one of the cave walls. Matt, look. Matt squinted, and then walked closer to where she was pointing. He grinned, slapped the rock, and then turned back to the group. The Mark of Noah That, says Noah? Rachel looked at the few scratched scars on the wall. 
She could have quite easily assumed there were a few odd chisel marks in the stone. She reached up to trace them with a fingertip. It could be characters, I guess. It is. It's the oldest form of his name. It also means rest, comfort. Matt turned, looking at the cave's wall and ceiling. Perhaps when the water was high, this might have been one of the places they took their rest and comfort in. Joshua's light wobbled as he brought it closer. Well, if we're going to be trapped, at least we might be trapped in the right place. This is what you came for? Okembu asked. No, this is just a signpost. Matt moved his light to the interior. We need to go deeper. These mountains are not a good place. They have many caves, some very deep. Okembu's eyes shone white in the darkness. I know you told us taboo, right? Matt said softly, and then sighed. But the captain's right. We need to watch our step. Anyone wanders off in here, and they might find they'll be the next artifact uncovered in another thousand years. So we follow the yellow brick road, Rachel said. Yellow brick road? Okembu frowned. Forget it. Rachel shone her light back into the darkness and headed off. The group stayed close together. Matt, Rachel, and Khaled led them out. Greta and Eleanor were next. Then came Okembu, and finally Saib helped Joshua hobble along at the rear. Rachel's senses were on high alert. There were eight of them remaining. Only an hour before there had been fifteen, including Okembu's drivers. Nearly half their number had been killed in the blink of an eye. She felt a pang of loss for the affable professor, Abdul Ibadi. The man was enormously enthusiastic, and though he had at least died doing what he loved, he might have just missed out on something that could have been classed as the absolute peak of his life's work. Rachel's eyes shifted over her shoulder to the tall and sullen Chad Army captain. The guy looked angry all the time now. Three of his men had been killed, and he hadn't even mentioned them. Out here, life was cheap or worthless, she guessed. I can smell something, Okembu said, sniffing. Rock dust, minerals, maybe even some of the residue from the explosives, Joshua said. Fool, I know more about those things than you lambs who live in western cities. What I smell is earth, fresh earth, and not cave or desert dust. Rachel sniffed. She could smell nothing but ancient dryness, but maybe that was due to the floating particles that tickled her nose and got deep into the nasal passages, making her want to hawk it out. Any more signs? she whispered to Matt, not knowing why she felt the need to hush her voice. Nothing, Matt said, yet. But the passage goes on, and luckily it's not narrowing. They continued on, the cave bending to the left, and then angling down slightly. Rachel felt the perspiration trickling down her back, even though it must have been twenty degrees cooler in the cave. Thankfully, the gentle breath of a breeze dried the sweat on her forehead and gave some relief. Breeze? Hey, she said. Anyone else feel that? Yes, and for a few minutes now, Khaled said. It's coming from up ahead. They increased their pace until Matt's sudden scream jolted some and made the rest cringe. Saib's gun was immediately up. He's fallen. Khaled held them back from the circular pit in the center of the cave. Matt! Rachel dived forward, allowing herself to slide to the edge. She shone her light down into the void. Matt lay about a dozen feet down on a flat ledge. He was pushing himself up to sit and holding his head. Don't move! she yelled. 
Beyond him there was nothing but darkness. It was sheer luck he had fallen where he had, because if he'd missed the ledge, he would have disappeared into nothingness. I'm okay. He looked up at them, his face white and squinting at all the lights beaming down on him. He put a hand over his eyes and then turned to look around. This is it. He faced them again. This is where we need to be. He pointed. Look. Matt sat still for a few moments to let his dizziness subside. He inhaled, smelling the odors on the breeze. Okembu had been right. It did now smell like fresh earth, and there was something else. Dampness, obvious after the dryness of the cave. He hated caves, and darkness, and pressing walls of jagged stone. He'd been in them before, and it never ended well. But for some reason in here it felt... right. In fact, it felt better than right. It felt like home. He shook his flashlight, and it immediately came back to life. Shining it around, he saw there were smooth stones beneath him. He got up to crouch. What he had landed on was no natural outcrop of rock, but instead a platform of interlocking stones. He grinned and rubbed at the stone. I don't believe it, he thought, and looked up to the group. Steps! He turned back to follow them with his light. They led from the ledge he was on to then curve around the outside of the circular pit. It reminded him of the inside of one of the large smokestacks he had seen on a trip to London once. Inside the huge funnel structure, there were maintenance steps winding up and corkscrewing all the way up to the light, except here they spiraled down into the darkness. Matt crept to the edge and shone his light down further. He couldn't see the bottom, but the steps continued ever onward into the gloom. Hey! Matt yelled, and waited for the echo to finish. What is it? Rachel yelled down to him. He turned and put a finger to his lips. Shush! I'm checking something. Hey! Matt yelled again, and listened, this time holding his breath and counting. There was no echo. That usually meant the cave was so large that the reverberation return simply got lost as the sound waves traveled too far and dissipated. Matt went to kneel back from the edge, when from the depths there was a blink of yellow light that drew his head back around. What the? He leaned forward, bringing his light around to where he had seen the glow. Had he seen two lights or one? He kept motionless just staring for several moments. What are you doing? Rachel's impatient voice made him jump. Nothing. I thought... He knelt back again. It's nothing. He panned his light around once more. About five feet up, the mark of Noah was etched into the wall. This is it. What have you got? Rachel yelled back. Big cave, but there's a way down, and I can feel a breeze coming up. He got to one knee. Can you make it down to here? He shone his light on the cave wall. He could see there probably had been steps once, but they looked to have broken off long ago. To get down, it'd mean a jump. There was a hurried conversation above. Yes, we think so. We'll lower each other down. Khaled said. There was more discussion, followed by scraping and scuffing of boots on rock, and then Khaled was eased down. Saib stretched out, lowering him while he held on to his leather belt. At the end of the belt, and with his arms fully extended, Khaled only had about four feet left to go. Normally this would not have presented a problem, but as the ledge Matt was standing on was narrow, and over its edge, a seeming bottomless void, the Saudi needed to drop and stick. 
Ready when you are, Matt said softly, standing back but hands ready to catch him. Khaled let go and landed lightly, bending his knees and grabbing the rock wall. Matt put an arm around him, but he was fine. No problem, Matt patted his shoulder and then looked up. Next. It was Joshua's turn then, straining and sweating, as his ribs undoubtedly screamed as he extended his arms. He landed with a grunt and an expression of unadulterated pain. Both Matt and Khaled grabbed at him as he wobbled for a second or two. We got you. Matt held on for a few seconds more. You okay? Not really, but I'm down. Joshua held his side and moved out of the way. His face looked drawn, and he glanced around nervously. Some skittering against rock, and Matt looked up to see Rachel's legs easing down. Stand back. She landed like a cat and immediately straightened. Next came Greta, who refused to let Eleanor drop by herself, so still had the tiny bird-like woman strapped to her back. Greta had no trouble hanging on, but the extra weight on her back when she dropped caused her to thrust her arms wide for a second, until both Matt and Khaled grabbed her. We've got you, Khaled said. The woman lurched forward and hugged the stone. Her eyes were squeezed shut. Matt had his arm around her and felt the small body of Eleanor Van Helling on her back. She squirmed slightly, and he had the strange sensation of a baby moving in a mother's belly. Matt recoiled, and looking across at Khaled, he saw that he too had moved back from the big woman. From behind him there came the sound of rocks falling into the pit. Had they dislodged them? he wondered. Captain Okembu came next, and seemed to be moving too fast. Take it easy, it's a long way down if you miss, Matt said. Okembu snorted and let go. He landed lightly, not needing their hands on him, as his long arms allowed him to come nearly all the way to the ledge. The last to come was Saib, and Matt knew the guy was going to be a problem. He was big and solid, probably coming in at about 220 pounds. And even though he looked fit and agile, the problem was there was no one to lower him. He'd have to lower himself somehow, meaning his drop would be closer to seven feet as opposed to their four. Stand back. The man pushed his legs over the edge and began to lower himself. He found a few handholds and tried to climb down a few extra inches to save him some drop space. He looked down, readying himself. Give me room. Khaled and Matt both took a step back. Khaled stood with hands propped. Ready, brother. The commando let go. He came down hard and immediately needed to take a step back to get his balance. Saeed put one of his boots right on the edge. It crumbled under his weight, and his arms swung widely. More chunks of stone broke off the ledge and fell back into the darkness. Matt saw them soundlessly fall. And also, down deep, the blink of yellow light again. Two of them, close together. Saeed! Khaled leapt for his man. Matt threw an arm around him, and Khaled gripped his collar. They managed to lever him back before gravity and Saib's significant weight ripped him free. The commando stood back on the edge, his balance restored. He leaned forward with his hands on his knees and breathing hard. Thank you. Saib looked briefly back over his shoulder. Long way down, he grinned at Matt. Matt went to grin back but the words caught in his throat. Something enormous loomed up behind the commando. Two yellow, pupilless eyes the size of softballs blinked open, and Matt had the impression of hulking shoulders and skin 
that looked like it was made of broken rock or splintered wood that was all knots and sharp edges. Ogreish features were twisted as it took them all in. Matt felt light-headed with fear, and he backed up, pushing Rachel behind him. Khaled fumbled for his gun. Saib spun then, but before the large commando could even draw a weapon, hands that looked like ancient tree bark wrapped around him, covering most of his upper body, and lifted him off his feet. He grunted in pain once, and then the thing vanished back into the abyss, taking the man with him. Khaled was frozen, his mouth open and his eyes wide and staring into the darkness. Matt tried to swallow but couldn't. Rachel gripped his back and peered over his shoulder. Was that another one of those things? She hissed into his ear. Matt gulped. Yes, I think it was another of the Nephilim. Nephilim? Khaled turned to him. Just like in the mountaintop, his teeth were bared. Captain Okembu had a long knife that looked... Angel? Okembu snarled. Did you not see that abomination? That was no angel, Professor Man. No, not now. But they were once, according to legend, before they fell from grace. Matt shook his head. I don't know. This was Ibadi's field. Well, he is not here. Okembu took a step toward Matt, the long blade still in his hand. But we are here, and so is that thing. Khaled stepped closer. We also encountered one of these things. It was in the cave of Shem, Noah's son. Did you kill it? Okembu asked. We tried. Khaled said, but I'm not sure we even hurt it. There was the softest of thumps from deep down in the pit. Okembu bared his teeth and looked momentarily back up at the rim of the pit. There's no going back, Rachel said. We're all in this together whether we like it or not. Greta was standing with her back to the wall. Eleanor rose up from behind her shoulder. Matthew, might it come back? Matt looked from her down into the pit. Probably, but the last time I managed to see it off. We need to be vigilant and maybe a little quieter. Less squabbling will help. It came from down there, Rachel said, following his gaze. And we're about to follow it. We have no choice, dear, Eleanor said. Like you said, there are no other options. No, we do have a choice. We go back. The voice was tiny, and they turned to see Joshua sitting on the ground, with his hands up over his head. If we go down, we die. Rachel went and crouched beside him. Hey there, you're okay now. He started to shudder, and at first they thought he was sobbing, until he lifted his head. His eyes were wet, but he threw his head back and laughed long and loud. <laughs> Why wouldn't I be okay? Keep it down. Matt looked over his shoulder into the pit. Yes, everything is just fine and dandy. We're all having a great time. Joshua laughed some more. He dropped his hands his voice shrill. I deal with the microscopic, not with things that look like monsters made from petrified wood. He tugged on his own hair. Lead on, Professor Kearns, straight to hell. <laughs> Matt grimaced and put his finger to his lips. Rachel stood. Fine. Be an asshole. It's okay, Joshua. We're all scared, Matt said still trying to wave the man to quietness. After another moment, Captain Okembu growled deep in his chest and pointed his blade. Listen, spectacle man, if your noise brings the beast back, I will make sure it is you it takes next. 
Joshua put his hands over his face and quietened, but still shook. Okembu stared for another moment, but then turned to Matt and rubbed his chin. So this thing was a guard? He nodded, sheathing his sword. One thing I know, Professor. You only have guards for something you value. Matt turned to look into the tall Chadian captain's eyes. Or maybe something a god wanted protected. I can smell fresh air coming up, Joshua said. The young scientist seemed somewhat composed, but his eyes were overly bright, and he glanced around skittishly, unable to keep still. Matt sniffed. I can smell earth and water and something else. But whether that's the outside air is another matter. Well, I've got everything crossed, Rachel said. Matt went to Khaled, who was leaning back against the wall, his eyes closed. Are you okay? After a moment, the Saudi nodded. Those men, Saib, Yasha, Rizwan, and Zahil, they were more than bodyguards. I've known them all my life. They were my friends. I'm sorry for Saib and for all of them. Matt waited. After a moment, Khaled nodded and straightened. What happens is God's will. Matt gripped the man's shoulder for a moment and then turned back to the group. We go down slowly and we only use every second flashlight. Not sure how long we'll be in here, so saving batteries means saving light. He looked at each of their faces, but there were no questions. Okay. Let's go. He led them down. They took the steps one at a time, following Saib's descent into the void. No one needed to be told to take it easy or stay back from the edge. One slip, and they knew they'd be joining the commando. Though they each watched where they placed their feet, they couldn't help peering over the edge, searching for movement or a glimpse of the pale yellow glow. They knew the thing was down there somewhere, perhaps watching and waiting for them. After a while, Khaled leaned out and shone his light downwards. Still can't see the bottom. We've been traveling for hours, and by my estimates we should be well below ground level. I agree. If this place was sealed, it'd make a great home if the land outside was near totally submerged for months. That long? Rachel asked. Well, according to the Bible, it says that after it rained for forty days and forty nights, and the highest mountains were covered by a depth of fifteen cubits, that's about twenty-two feet, then the world was water, or at least Noah's world was water. The new ocean prevailed on the earth for another 150 days, and supposedly everything that wasn't aboard the ark died. 150 days. Five months. Wow, Rachel said. Longer than that, Matt said as he walked. Forty days of rain, 150 of flood, then more months just waiting for the first land to appear. They might have been stuck up on these mountains or inside them for years. They went into the earth, into these caves, Joshua snorted softly. A perfect sealed breeding ground for all sorts of multi-celled organisms looking to hitch a ride on a passing human. Nice, Rachel grimaced. Guess we might find out soon, Matt eased over a missing step. Gap here, watch it. They descended for another hour, and the air became noticeably cooler. Heart of the mountain, Khaled said. Heart? Much lower. More like the asshole now, yes? Okembu grinned and shone his light into the Saudi's face. Very poetic. Khaled glared back into the light. I can see the cave floor. Matt leaned out, another fifty feet below us. He also saw the debris, 
and crumpled and torn body of the security guard. He quickly flicked his light away. In another moment, they came off the circling stone steps onto the smooth floor. Looking up, there was nothing but a tunnel of impenetrable darkness above them. The group joined him, flicking lights around the base of the giant column. Khaled went to stand over Saib's body, his hands across his midsection, and his eyes closed. He spoke a funeral prayer, the Salat al-Janazah, for the man, finishing by holding his palms upward and raising his eyes. He returned and nodded to Matt, but Matt could see the sagging expression on the man's features. He had been deeply wounded by the loss of his friends. Multiple caves, multiple choices, Rachel said. Okembu pulled a small plastic cigarette lighter from his pocket and flicked it on. The tiny orange flame bent away from one direction. See how easy it is, he pointed. That one. Works for me, Matt said. You want to lead us in? Okembu seemed to think about it for a moment or two. No, this is your job. He gave Matt a small bow. I guess it is. Matt turned his light toward the new cave and headed in. Rachel and Khaled crowded in behind him, followed by Joshua, Greta, Eleanor, and then Akembu. It quickly became apparent that this was a natural opening in the stone, as there was no new stone being added or even any signs of it being worked by tools. It narrowed to about two feet in width, and then opened back out after another fifty feet. The smell of damp was growing stronger, and Matt caught sight of a glint of moisture on the floor and walls. After another few minutes, mosses started to appear, and then came the humidity. How far down are we? Rachel asked. At a guess, I'd say a few hundred feet below ground level. If there was any biblical flood water, then this is where it would have finally drained. I know this region, Okembu said softly. There are no streams, pools, marshes, or even a single oasis. If there is water in here, then it has never made it to the surface. Doesn't bode well for a way back out, then. Joshua's voice still had a brittle edge to it. The passage narrowed even more, so they began to travel in a single file. Stop! Matt came to a halt so quickly, Rachel bumped into his back. Her feet skidded, crunching debris beneath her. What is it? Rachel held her light over his shoulder. Matt squinted. I think I saw something moving in there. Moving? As in alive moving? She panned her light around. It's too narrow for our yellow-eyed giants. Khaled pointed his flashlight in another direction. I can see nothing. Maybe it was... He trailed off, perhaps not wanting to blame it on Matt's imagination. Fear and the dark plays tricks on some men. Calling from the back of the group, Okembu had no such timidity. Matt held his hand out, moving aside something that looked like hanging vines or roots, as he half turned to the group. I'm telling you, I saw something move, and I don't think it was a shadow, my imagination, or the damn breeze. As he pushed at the long vine things to ease them aside, they stuck. He turned back, frowning. What? The tendrils, some as thick as pencils, seemed to coil and move, winding up and around his wrist and fingers. Hey, these things! They tightened. Matt jerked his hand back, but the hanging vines were enormously strong, elastic, and adhesive like they had suckers on them. Ow! They're getting tight! Little help here, guys! He tugged, but more of the vines coiled around his hand. Khaled grabbed Matt's shoulders and held on, as Rachel went to grab at the vines over his shoulder. Don't touch them! Matt yelled. 
Matt felt his entire hand begin to throb as the circulation was cut off at the wrist. The vines had circled many of his individual fingers, and they tightened, making them first turn red and then a deep, angry purple. Jesus Christ! There was an audible snap as one of his fingers broke. Matt yanked at it, pulling with all his weight and strength, but it was like fighting against rubberized leather. The coils moved along his forearm, and then his entire arm began to be drawn upward. He howled as a second finger snapped, and the tendrils tried to reel him toward the tunnel roof. He looked up and saw that the vines disappeared into a large crack above him. Inside, he thought he saw something large and fleshy there, like a soft mouth opening and closing, as if smacking its lips in anticipation of the treat to come. The pain made tears well up in his eyes, and he screamed again from the agony and frustration, and then braced his legs. He felt more of the crunching underfoot, and quickly glanced down to see that the ground was littered with the bones of small animals. Whatever this thing was, this was where it did its fishing. It yanked again, and more tendrils lifted toward him. Get this fucking thing off me! There was chaos as bodies tried to shove past him, or around him to help, while also trying to avoid the coiling tendrils. More dropped down, and they seemed to writhe and jiggle in excitement. Matt felt one tickle his ear, and felt panic rise in his gut, at the thought of them circling his neck and pulling his whole body up so his head disappeared into the red, fleshy maw now just visible in that fucking crack in the rock. Get it off! Don't let it— he knew he was panicking as he thrashed, but his fight-or-flight instinct had taken control of him now. There was a thud on his back that wrenched his arm nearly from its socket and caused another of his fingers to snap. The agony was now like a fire all the way up his arm. The thump and crush came again as Captain Okembu jumped across the top of the crowd, holding aloft his machete blade. He couldn't get a full swing happening but he managed enough force to hack through several of the vine things hanging down. He severed more on the backswing, yelling a battle cry as he worked. Sticky liquid splashed down on them, and above it all there came an inhuman squeal, and momentarily the vines seemed to make a concerted effort to drag Matt away from the group. He began to lift off his feet, but Captain Okembu slashed again and again, cutting away more of the writhing vines. He stopped and looked up, and then jammed the long blade up into the crevice. This time the squeal became ear-piercing, and was accompanied by mad thrashing as the vines pulled back into the roof, and in another instant had vanished. Matt fell back to the ground, striking his head hard, and everything went black. The dark cave, the thing in the roof, and the shouting of his companions all vanished. Instead there was nothing but a luminous pool of water, and rising from it the goddess. It was her again, and this time she raised a hand, beckoning. Matt felt his heart race in his chest, and never in his life had he felt such raw attraction. An animal lust welled up inside him as the woman approached. Thick blonde hair fell to her shoulders, and it seemed to sparkle with highlights of gold, red, and silver. She smiled a perfect smile, in features that could have been Nordic, with high cheekbones, taut jawline, and a sharp, pointed nose. But it was her eyes that held him. They glowed with a sapphire intensity that was impossible to look away from. He smiled back and she held out a hand. Matt did the same. Their fingertips slid past each other, and then she took his hand and pulled him closer. The goddess held his hand in hers and angled her head and parted her lips, ready to kiss him. Matt couldn't resist, and his own mouth began to open, desiring those plump lips against his own more than anything else in the world. Just as they were inches apart, 
Matt looked down at the parted lips. But inside there was no tongue, but instead a thousand soft, tiny worms welling up from her throat. He gagged and went to pull back, but she held on. She still had his hand, and her strength was unbelievable. He tugged, but couldn't break her grip, and her hand got tighter and tighter on his, the pain becoming unbearable. His eyes flicked open. <laughs> the word hissed out through his gritted teeth like steam. He looked up at Okembu, who stood over him in the dark cave, knife still ready, and facing the roof where the thing had dropped down to ambush him. Captain, where? Matt looked around, grimacing. Thank you. Okembu, looking down, nodded. Professor Man, exactly what was that? There is no plant like that in these deserts that I have ever seen. Joshua was crouching nearby and picked up a piece of the severed tendril. I don't think it's a plant at all. He sniffed it. Phew! Yep, that's not sap leaking from it. It's blood, and it was covered in hairs. Shine that light over here. Khaled moved his light closer, and Matt cautiously leaned across. Joshua squeezed the tendril. It's got a sort of exoskeleton, like an insect, but leathery. More like a spider, I guess. Shit! That thing is a spider? Matt got to his feet with Rachel grabbing him under the arm. This is becoming a habit. She held him up. He grinned brokenly. This is why I love field work. Maybe this thing once was a spider. But you live in a lightless cave. You adapt to hunting any way you can. Joshua reached down to pick up a length of tendril that was a good three feet long and as thick as a garden hose. It was spiked with hair. And I can tell you one thing. For this creature to have adapted like this, it's been here a long, long time. Khaled grimaced. That thing was big. To sustain that bulk, it must get a lot of food. Matt pointed at the ground. All the skeletons on the ground. I should have known. This is its killing field, fed on bats and anything else that wandered along this cave corridor. Yeah, mostly. Joshua picked up a larger shard of bone. It was the remains of a jaw of some sort of simian. If it only fed on bats, it would have steered clear of something the size of you. I think it's also proficient at trapping bigger game than that. He looked up at the ceiling. Blood still dropped from the edges. We should move away from here, Joshua said, looking jumpy again, his eyes showing all their whites. Gets my vote, Matt said, cradling his hand. Hey, look here. Khaled bent over to pick an object up from the cave floor. Gold. He rubbed at it and then flicked it open. Ha! Ah, an old cigarette lighter. He spun the striking wheel but got no response. Looks like we aren't the first people through here. Khaled looked around. And either this means they made it past the spider trap, he turned to the group, or he was just about to walk into it. Khaled squinted at the lighter. There's something written on it. C-V-H. Let me see that. Eleanor held out a hand, and Khaled handed it to her. Well, give me some light here, young man, she demanded. Khaled held his flashlight over her shoulder onto the object. The old woman's lips curled up at the corners. C-V-H. Clarence Van Helling. She pressed it to her lips momentarily and ground her eyes shut. He was here. And we know he made it out, eventually, Khaled said. He turned his light down the dark cave tunnel. 
So this might be the right way after all. Then let's keep going, Rachel said. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Let's just get away from here. Matt straightened but knocked his hand and yelped. He chanced to look at it. The fingers were bent at odd angles, were now multi-hued, and looked as horrifyingly painful as they felt. Luckily, the skin wasn't broken, and no compound fractures had burst through the skin. Wait. Khaled held out his hand, taking Matt's in his own. If we don't get those bones into alignment, they may cut off the flow of blood. You'll get gangrene. We need to straighten them. He looked into Matt's eyes. Do you know what that means? Something extremely painful, I'm sure. Matt tried to pull his hand back, but Khaled held on. He felt perspiration break out on his top lip. He looked down at his damaged hand and at the fingers that bent every which way. He knew Khaled was right. Close your eyes, Khaled said softly. Ah, Jesus. Matt did as he was told and felt the Saudi take one of his broken fingers in his hand. Think of something nice, he said, on the count of three. Matt took himself to a beach, to blue, shimmering waves, endless sunshine, and... Khaled began. One. There was a sudden yank, accompanied by a crunching noise, that was immediately drowned out by a scream. His own. What happened to two, three, go? Sweat had broken out all over his face and he looked down at the finger. It was now straight, but purple-black and obscenely fat around the knuckle. Well, there's two to go, Rachel said, placing a hand on his shoulder. Matt sucked in a huge breath and looked away. Go for it. Two more yanks and two more fingers still broken, but at least all poking in the right direction now. Rachel wrapped the hand in her handkerchief and helped him put it into his open shirt front to act as a sling. We can try to splint it when we're away from here, Khaled said. Thanks. Matt was content to just let it throb away close to his chest. He was also glad the fingers weren't ripped free or worse. His head pulled up into the thing's lair inside the crack. Let's move he said between compressed lips. Captain Okembu wiped the sticky black fluid from his blade and resheathed it on a belt. He checked a large, fake-looking Rolex on his wrist. Dawn is only an hour away. In here that means nothing, Joshua said. Khaled led them out. The going was slower as they now needed to check every nook and cranny before they stepped over it, ducked under, or squeezed past it. The slight breeze grew stronger and thankfully cooler, and soon the cave had opened out into a wider passage. Underfoot the ground squelched, and here and there small pale plants rose from the sodden ground. Thank all the prophets. There's something up ahead, Khaled said. And I can hear... I'm not sure, but it sounds like rustling. Like wind in the trees, Rachel added. They stepped under a low archway and then stopped. Even though it was Stygian dark inside, Matt tilted his head, concentrating. He had the impression of vast size. Rachel took off her backpack and fished inside. She pulled free a flare gun which she quickly broke open and checked. This is a one and only, so hope it works. She snapped it closed, pointed the gun up and forward, and then fired. The red flare shot into the air above them, before igniting at about 150 feet up and that far in. It floated down slowly on its tiny parachute, its miniature red sun illuminating the vista before them. Matt felt his mouth drop open, and Khaled turned, a huge grin splitting his face. Akebulan.
the Garden of Eden. Chapter 18 The group spread out along the small ledge. The sight that met their eyes was beyond anything they could have imagined. It was a jungle, enormous, stretching as far as they could see within the glow of the flare. As the ball of light fell, it illuminated the tops of ferns, huge trees, and towering palms, with even the glint of a small stream cutting through it. Matt knew that shallow caves could support shade-loving ferns, and deeper in, liverworts, mosses, and lichens. But this was a growth that would rival the jungles of the Amazon or Congo Basin. It's hollow, Khaled breathed. Oh, my God. Rachel's mouth was also hanging in an open smile, and the red blush from the flare was reflected back like dots of blood in her pupils. The flare slowly died, and the massive cavern returned to blackness. Matt held up a hand flat. Even in the dark, I can sense it, the life. He closed his eyes and inhaled. There's our answer to the smell of dampness, the fresh air, and earth. I wish Prince Najif could see this, Khaled smiled dreamily. I know it is exactly as he hoped. How? Rachel whispered. How did it get in here? How does it even survive in here? Okembu started to look for a way down, but Matt stopped him. Wait, we're not ready yet. Maybe you aren't. The Chadian soldier snatched his arm away and then looked at his watch. I am hungry and thirsty, and I think there will be game here, for all of us. He held up his large watch to Matt's face. Nearly six a.m., and that is my breakfast time, Professor. Look, Joshua pointed. Out on the floor of the cavern, still partially obscured by the trees, a soft blue glow had begun to emanate. Did we just make that happen? Matt asked. There's more, Rachel said, as columns of light began to drop down from above. Somebody is turning on the lights for us. She flicked off her flashlight. Matt laughed. This is so cool. Remember the image in the stained glass, what we thought was the radiance of God. There were beams of golden light falling from high up to one side of the cavern ceiling. This is what it meant. He grinned and pointed. You asked about how it survives, the forest. He pointed to the huge columns of light. There's your answer. The cave is punctured, letting in some light. He held out a hand. And the ground is warm maybe from some sort of hot spring beneath us. The vents in the ceiling allow light to enter, but the cavern traps the moisture. It's like a giant greenhouse in here. It's enormous, Joshua said. I can't even see where it ends. The multiple beams of light grew stronger as the sun rose outside the skin of the cave. The golden columns illuminated a lush forest of palms, ferns, and towering trees that could have been banyan, and a broader tree type below them. Acacia, Captain Okembu snorted. Nearly fifty years ago, the last acacia died in the Sahara Desert. There was much weeping by environment people. And yet here, there are too many to count. Hiding, perhaps. Eight to ten thousand years ago, the whole area was covered in forest. This is probably the last remnant, Matt said. He turned to Akembu. This is probably what your country looked like five thousand years ago. Beautiful, the tall Chadian whispered. Trapped in its own specimen jar, Joshua said. He looked around slowly. It's warm, damp. Twilight lit and heavily forested, perfect for parasites. We need to be careful. 
Well, that certainly breaks the magic moment, Rachel jibed. Joshua spun. I'm being serious. His voice was high. And I meant it. Be careful. Matt showed his bandaged hand. Yeah, now he tells us to be careful? The light over there is different. Khaled pointed out toward the center of the huge space, where the soft glow seemed to emanate. But there it looked like it rose up from the ground, instead of filtering down. It's blue, Joshua said. Could be some form of bioluminescence. Some organisms are able to activate a protein called luciferase that produces a natural blue light. We should check it out, said Matt. Pretty dense forest, more a jungle, Rachel said. Given what attacked you in that cave, I'm not happy about all that cover for potential predators. She turned to the group. And did anyone notice it's not silent in here anymore? As one, they turned back to the forest. She was right. They had all been focusing on the visual wonders, but failed to notice that there were now strange bird calls, insects humming, and rustling in among the foliage, and even more movement in the tree canopies. Could it have been the light that did it? Khaled asked. Maybe. Their own version of a dawn chorus, Matt said. This place is a self-contained, fully functioning ecosystem. We should have expected it the moment we saw the plant life. Joshua wrapped his arms around himself. I don't like it. Matt saw that the parasitologist had taken to biting his bottom lip, so much so there was blood on his chin. You okay there? And if I wasn't? Joshua grinned a little too wide for a moment. Sure, sure. Just a little overwhelmed. I can see a path of some sort, Khaled pointed, or a water course we can follow. Yeah, great. Stick to the water, Joshua giggled, like no parasites have ever been found in water. Will you put a lid on it? Rachel rounded on him. Jesus Christ, we're all on edge here. Just keep your shit together and we'll be fine. You keep saying that. We'll be fine. Joshua scratched his head. Thank heavens, because I thought for a moment there that we were trapped in the middle of the Sahara Desert, hundreds of feet underground, after most of our people had been killed, and Professor Kearns was attacked by something that dropped from the ceiling, like some sort of spider jellyfish thing from hell. He put a hand over his mouth to stifle a laugh, but then spoke through his fingers. We'll be fine, so now let's all walk into a dark jungle. See, you sound better already. Rachel walked away from the man. The man's a coward and an idiot, but he's right. Eleanor allowed Greta to ease her from her back, so the small, bird-like old woman could stand by herself. Gee, thanks, Mum, Joshua sneered. We are trapped in here, she said. Maybe we will find everything we seek in that forest. But what good is it if we cannot find our way back out? She smacked her lips, and Greta immediately gave her a sip from a canteen. Eleanor pushed her away. We should split up. A few of us go and explore the pool, and the rest look for a way out. Pool? What pool? Matt turned to her. Or whatever that blue glow is. She waved it away. But I know that you know, Professor, that time is against us now. It's not a good idea. Matt felt his slung arm. We need to stay together. Who knows what else we'll encounter down here? He went to sip his water, but found he had already drained it. Shit. Here. Rachel pulled her canteen from her belt pouch and held it out. She paused, frowning. Are you okay? She came closer, holding her light up. She shook her head. You've got to take it easy. You look like crap. 
Matt felt his face. Even with his fingertips, he could feel the sunken cheeks and hollowed eyes. He held up his broken hand. Cut me some slack. I've had a bad day. Rachel held his chin. I'm worried, Matthew. Matt jerked his head back from her tender touch. I feel fine. Leave him be, Eleanor said. The old woman continued to stare at Matt from half-closed eyes for a moment. She turned to Khaled. We need to find a way out, now. She's right. Look at Professor Kearns. We're all being worn down. We need to get back home, Khaled said. We're close to the cave wall, and where the sunlight vents are. Might be a way up to one of them. Wouldn't hurt for a few of us to check them out, save time. Then we can all meet at the blue thing. It's been my professional experience that the longer we're exposed to host feeder environment, the more chance of a parasitic pathogen uptake and permanent damage to the host, Joshua said, his eyes wide and feverish. Parasitic pathogen uptake. Rachel sampled the words in her mouth before rubbing her neck. Matt? We don't know if this is even the source of the illness, Matt said, or even if it is an illness. I just don't like us splitting up at this time. But we do, and time matters, Matthew. Eleanor raised tiny painted eyebrows. Khaled held up a hand. I can check for a way out. Meet you at the center. It won't take me more than a few hours. I'll go with you, Matt said. No. Khaled held up a hand. You're the only one who can decipher anything that might be relevant and important. You need to go to the interior. Where Matt goes, I go, Rachel thrust out her chest. Greta will go with you, Khaled, said Eleanor. And might I also suggest the tall and strong Captain Okembu? Matt had a horrible thought. I'm sorry, but I can't carry you, Eleanor. He held up his bandaged hand. I'm walking wounded. Oh, no, no way. Joshua backed away. Shut up, the pair of you. Her wrinkled face creased with disdain. I wouldn't trust either of you pansies. For your information, I'll walk from here. She straightened, almost coming to Rachel's shoulder. Then it's settled, Khaled said. The captain, Greta, and myself will look for an opening to the outside. And, successful or not, we will meet you at the interior in... He checked his watch. Six hours. He started to turn away, but paused. And if there's any trouble, fire a shot in the air. We'll do the same. Deal, Matt said. Good luck. He shook the Saudi's hand. Okembu gave Matt a small salute with a couple of fingers, and then turned away. Greta's eyes lingered on Eleanor for a moment longer, before she followed the two men. Captain Abdullah Mokalemi Okembu was thirty-two years old, and had been in the Chad National Army for a dozen years. Before that, he was a boy soldier fighting in one of the many tribal collisions that seemed never-ending out in the desert nothingness of the great plains between Zuar and Bardai. He had killed many men, and he had come across many people, men and women, who had been killers— some were brutal blunderers that were big enough to crush a man's head with their bare hands. Others used knife, spear, or gun, or snuck into windows in the dead of the night to slit throats or throttle the soul from a body. Okembu could spot them now, all of them. The killers had the same eyes, ones that were dead inside. They were like dark glass, which were windows onto a black soul. He saw that look now. The group was mostly lambs, but among them hid a wolf. He would need to watch himself, sleep with an eye open, and never turn his back. He would be patient. If they struck, then he would be ready and strike back harder. 
Okembu knew how to survive. He watched Khaled's team vanish toward the cave cliff wall, and then Matt faced the thick forest. Let's follow the stream. It looks like it heads to the interior and to the, uh, pool, right, Eleanor? He turned and raised his eyebrows at the old woman. She ignored him, and so Matt started down to the forest floor. Rachel grabbed him. Seriously, you're going to lead out with that busted wing? Best if you leave this one to me. She stepped in front of him and went to flick her flashlight on, but changed her mind. Light's not bad now, and I guess it wouldn't hurt to save the batteries. I'm not going last, Joshua said quickly. Fine, I will, Matt said. But you go next, and as an added bonus, as you're the only fit man here, you get to give Eleanor assistance when she needs it. I won't, she snapped. Team bonding session is over, let's go. Rachel stepped down from the rock ledge. Matt sighed and looked briefly over his shoulder. And that means I get to bring up the rear. Shit. Rachel picked her way down the gentle slope until her feet sank into soft soil. The group followed quickly, with Eleanor refusing Joshua's hand and eventually coming down on all fours, like some sort of tiny, well-dressed insect. In no time they were pushing through the dense foliage. They followed the sound of gurgling water and soon found a small pool where the water swirled and then drained beneath a large stone. Match on his light in the pond. It was clear, and a few small fish darted about in it. Eleanor immediately knelt, and dipped a hand into it and lifted it to her lips. Don't do that, Joshua lunged, knocking her hand from her mouth. The water is more than likely the source of the parasite, he implored. She turned back slowly, her lip curled. Look to yourself, you young pup. She dipped her hand into the water again and brought the cupped palm to her lips. She closed her eyes and tilted her head back, as if waiting for something. After a moment she opened her eyes, held up her hand, turned it over and stared hard at it, before turning it over and looking again at its back. She seemed to deflate. Nothing. What were you expecting? Matt asked, but already knew. Rejuvenation? Fuck off. Eleanor rose to her feet, small brown teeth bared. Rook! Matt recoiled. Mad, he thought, or perhaps obsessed. Come on, Rachel said. We'll follow the water. Stay on its bank. They moved slowly, and Matt noticed that none of them needed to be told to be quiet. Even so, they didn't need to be that silent, as the forest certainly wasn't silent around them, with all the movement, animal and bird calls, and water gurgling. The odd thing was, other than the tiny fish they had previously seen, the wildlife seemed content to be vocal but invisible. The back of Matt's neck prickled, and he couldn't resist looking over his shoulder. He felt sure they were being watched, and for the last few minutes he even had the distinct feeling that someone or something was keeping pace with them on the other side of the stream. Several times he spun, pointing his light into the undergrowth, but each time he saw nothing. Jumpy as all hell, he knew. He grinned. Imagining what Rachel would say to him, Grow a pair, will you? He snorted and hurried on. Odd, he thought. Now he was aware of the sound of his footsteps, and could only hear them because the sounds of the forest had silenced. He spun again. This time there was a round face peering through a bush. The flesh was corpse pale, and the skin oddly moving rippling like ribbons being wound over each other. Eck! Matt jerked back fast and fell onto his ass. The face was quickly pulled away. 
What? Rachel stopped and turned. Matt pointed, feeling his heart rate going through the roof. Something's following us. Matt shone his wobbling light back into the shadowed foliage. The group each followed his gaze, and then turned slowly, searching the overgrown areas nearest themselves. They all froze, listening and watching. I don't see anything, Rachel said. It's probably just the shadows. We're all tired. Matt got to his feet. Bullshit! I know shadows, and they don't have— Kearns, please! I'm nervous enough as it is. Joshua's light beam whipped around and into his face. Matt pointed. But— You're not in the classroom now, Professor, Eleanor smirked. Come on, Matt, stay cool. Rachel's brows were sloping over her eyes in pity. Do you need to walk up here beside me? Oh, good grief. He turned one last time to the foliage, but there was nothing now. Forget it. The sounds of the forest had returned. Hours passed, and then more. The fatigue was starting to affect all of them. In addition, the angle of the light from the glowing columns from the ceiling was changing as the sun obviously moved across the sky outside. Matt wondered how Khaled was getting on, as even though curiosity was still burning within him, he knew it wouldn't be long until the sun vanished once again, and this time they'd be in the center of a forest in darkness. Daylight's burning. Rachel picked up her pace, and together they headed to the glowing place in the center of the forest. The darker it got in the cave, the more light seemed to emanate from up ahead. They moved quickly, carefully, now in a crouch. Matt saw that Eleanor had one bony hand down the back of Joshua's trousers, hanging on tight, and allowing the young man to pull her along. He wondered what would happen if she stumbled. Would she be pulled forward like a small dog on a lead? Rachel slowed and then stopped, and peered through some foliage. She slowly raised a hand. Just up ahead. She pushed the fronds aside and squeezed through. Joshua was on her heels, dragging the tabin trauma. But the hand looked bony, almost skeletal, as if the fat and muscle was somehow missing. Matt felt his face again, feeling the sharp cheekbones. There was no doubt in his mind. He had somehow been infected, and now the nematodes or whatever they were were eating him alive. How? he wondered, and dropped his hand again, wiggling the once broken fingers. Just like the dog bite, he thought. But this time it took only a few hours to heal. Shit he thought, and made a fist. He looked up to see Eleanor watching him with a smirk. He smiled weakly and lowered his hand, but before the woman could speak, there came the sound of two quick gunshots from over at the far side of the cave. Khaled! Matt spun. Chapter 19 Khaled ibn al-Sudairi stopped to wipe his brow. They'd been skirting around the edge of the forest at the cave wall for most of the day. There was a rocky platform several dozen feet over the basin-shaped interior where the lush plants and trees grew out of an obviously fertile enclosure. So far, all of the holes that were allowing the huge columns of light inside the cavern were hundreds of feet above where they stood with no way to reach them. In addition, the interior walls were steep to begin with, but then towered over them to become a roof, so climbing up was out of the question. A while back they had crossed a small side tunnel that harbored one of the tentacle things that had made a grab at Professor Kearns. Khaled kept his gun trained on it as he waved Okembu and Greta past but it seemed that the creature became triggered by movement and didn't present them with any trouble as long as they moved slowly and stayed out of its reach. 
Personally, he would have loved to pull the disgusting thing from its lair to kill it, or at least get a good look at the abomination. Okembu was on edge. A few miles back, he had fashioned a small spear and made them wait while he carefully stalked a large, fat parrot sitting on a tree branch. The thing had just sat there, watching him approach. Okimbu had lined it up, thrown with unerring deftness, to strike its colorful, plumed target dead on. But then came the wrongness. The bird seemed to explode. Feathers, flesh, beak, and bone all came apart, as if the thing was made of nothing but colored liquid. What is this? Okembu stood with his mouth open, watching as the multicolored liquid soaked into the ground and vanished. He turned. Did I hit it? I hit it. He nodded vigorously. Didn't I hit it? You saw. Khaled's eyes narrowed. You hit it. Okembu went to retrieve his spear, but then changed his mind. I'll eat when we are out. Several miles further on lay the lowest of the cave holes that shone in a beam of golden light and was their most promising chance of scaling a way out. Khaled looked at his watch. If it, too, proved an impossible climb, then they might need to give up on this option and cross into the forest to meet up with Professor Kearns's group and work on a new plan. I can't. Khaled turned. The voice was unrecognizable at first, and he realized he had rarely heard the tall female nurse of Mrs. Van Helling speak. She was down on one knee. You need more rest? Khaled asked. Okembu snorted his derision and looked away. I need... She held out a hand to Captain Okembu. He looked back at her but his face was without pity. So, the helper asks for help. Please, Greta beckoned, looking pained. No. The tall Chadian officer's expression hardened, and he stepped back. Help her up, Khaled said softly. Okembu half turned to Khaled. This woman... Greta exploded up at him, staying low. Before Okembu could turn back, her hand glinted with a flash of silver that went from behind her back to hammer down and embed itself into the top of the man's foot and into the ground. Okembu howled and then pulled free his own huge blade, but by then Greta was coming up in front of him. With the knife nailing him to the ground, his ability to move was inhibited. On her rise, Greta snatched one of the Chadian officer's own knives from his belt and jammed it into his neck. Khaled's mouth dropped open in horror as he saw the twelve-inch blade protrude from just below Captain Okembu's opposite ear. The Chad army man's tongue extended, but no words could or would come. Repulsively, Greta then twisted the blade, opening the wound, and allowing the carotid artery to shower the wall of the cave. Khaled felt an electric shock of disbelief run through him. What? The tall woman ripped the blade free, allowing Okembu's body to fall like a tree trunk, but not down to the forest floor, as it was nailed to the ground by the blade. She then spun and began to advance on Khaled. Her face was calm, as if she was just ordering hot tea in her local café, and her brawny forearm was now covered in glistening blood to the elbow. He saw that her huge knuckles stood out like barnacles on a wharf as she adjusted her grip on the long, bloody blade. Khaled held up a hand. Stop! She didn't, and closed the distance between them in three great strides and slashed at his chest. He had jerked himself back, but the razor-sharp blade still opened his shirt and sliced the flesh beneath. Khaled then threw himself down, sweeping his leg around to strike at Greta's legs, and managed to knock the woman off her feet. She fell hard, but didn't stay there, instead snatching up a fist-sized rock in her free hand 
and coming back immediately. Khaled reached for his gun as he backpedaled. He tugged it free and brought it around, only to have the rock smash into his wrist, and the shots he fired ended up hopelessly off target. He went to adjust his stance, and his next step back was on only half the ledge they were both standing on. His arms pinwheeled as he lost his balance, and the huge woman shot out a hand to grip his gun arm. Khaled knew her blade would be coming up again, and this time his torso was fully exposed. He used her weight to jerk his head forward to headbutt the woman once and twice, feeling the satisfying crunch of bone each time. He waited for her to fall, cry out, or even blink, but instead she tore the gun from his hand and flung it aside. Greta still held him, and he looked momentarily over his shoulder at the drop behind him. When he turned back, the huge woman had her face close to his, and the eyes he stared into were the deadest things he had ever seen in his life. There was blood on her teeth, and she grinned like a death's head. Greta pointed the blade at his left eye and began to bring it forward. He made his choice and propelled himself backwards, falling the fifteen to twenty feet down to the dark rocks and earth below. He hoped for a soft landing. He didn't get one. The cliff edge was rock all the way to the bottom, and he struck the jagged surface hard, bouncing several times, before finally coming to rest at the mouth of a small cave. He dragged himself in as Greta followed him down. But when she arrived, the huge woman paused and didn't enter. Khaled waited, but instead of coming in to finish him off, the woman began to carefully back away, a knowing smile on her gargoyle-like features. It was then that Khaled felt the feather-like touch of the first sticky tendril. Chapter 20 That's the sign, Matt said. They're in trouble. We need to help. No, Eleanor snapped. We should continue on. It would be hours until we caught up with them. They're strong and competent, and will have overcome whatever problem assails them. Or have been overcome by it, Rachel said flatly. Eleanor shrugged bony shoulders. Either way. Matt scoffed. I would hope if we fired an alarm shot, they'd have a different attitude. Oh, pshaw, Professor. Stop being such a nervous Nelly. We're almost there. I say we continue on. Eleanor turned to Joshua. Dr. Gideon, what do you say? Joshua looked at Matt's miraculously repaired hand. I say we see what lies ahead. It's only a little more climbing now. We've already done the hard part. It'll take us too long to be of any help to the others anyway. No, that's not right. I'm going to see what happened. Matt held his ground. Eleanor smacked dry lips. Young man, I'm too old to trek all the way over there now. We should stay together, but if you must go, then you must. Her lips compressed for a moment. So go. Matt looked at Rachel, who winced and shrugged. Matt, give it ten more minutes. That might mean we need to head over there anyway. Eleanor stared at him, and her eyes moved down his arm to his hand. Then back up at his face. Her expression was calculating. Professor, how have you been feeling lately? You seem a little drawn. Fine. I'm just fine. He straightened. Hey, you think I'm delirious or something? No, Professor. The old woman smiled thinly. But I'm thirsty, hungry, tired, and I goddamn ache all over. And that's not just because I'm old. I bet your girlfriend there feels the same. She smirked. And yet you seem to have boundless energy, while looking a little hollow, to say the least. Why do you think that is? Huh? Matt touched his chest. I don't know what you're getting at. But he knew exactly what she meant. 
He did feel fine. In fact, better than fine. The bomb blast, Matthew, Eleanor said. You shouldn't even have survived. You were sitting right next to an FBI agent who was obliterated. His forehead puckered. The scabbard, it was supposed to... You know that's rubbish. You barely had a scratch, Eleanor said. The broken bones, the burns, the dog bite. Not even a single scar. Oh, God, it's true, Joshua said, pushing toward him. He grabbed Matt's head and lifted his flashlight to look into his eyes. Get the fuck off me, Matt pushed him away. What's the matter with you people? The parasites. Somehow you're infected, Joshua pointed. But it's eating you. Oh, piss off. How? Where? Matt looked at his hand, turning it over. That doesn't make sense. Rachel's gun was suddenly in her hand, but held loosely at her side. When Samuel died, you were there. When Oscar died at the church, you were there. And you led us here, and now more of us are dying, except you, who feels fine. Hey, hey! Matt held his hands up. This is insane! He started to back up. What's got into you? Rachel's eyes were implacable as her gun came up. Please, stay where you are. We need to work this out. He looked along their faces. Rachel's held nothing but resolve. Joshua's was twisted in fear, and Eleanor's had a smirk of satisfaction. He pointed at the old woman. She knows something. Look at her. I know a rat, Professor. Eleanor slowly shook her head. We know who's been keeping secrets, and I think we now know who's been leading us into all these traps. She half turned to Rachel. You need to stop him. He's been working against us ever since we got here. You son of a bitch, Joshua said, his eyes round. Have you all gone mad? Matt backed up some more. This is all going bad now, Matt thought. He started to ease back again. I didn't do anything. Matt, please, I'm warning you, please, stop. Rachel tracked him, the muzzle of her gun, a pitiless dark eye, following his every move. Kill him, Eleanor said, the thin gray skin over her face, making it look like a leather-covered skull. But she wasn't looking at Rachel or Matt, but just past him. The snap of a twig behind him made him flinch and turn, just as Greta's blade came down hard and fast, and aimed to bury itself between his shoulder blades. Instead, he jerked fast, and it caught the meat of his shoulder, cutting long and deep. The pain was excruciating, and Matt went down, rolled into the brush, and scrambled to throw himself off the small rock platform they were on. Matt landed hard on rock, but heard shouts, and more worryingly there was someone bullocking after him through the foliage. By the sound of the weight, he suspected Greta. Matt gripped his shoulder and ran, keeping low. In seconds, his entire upper body was slick with blood. There were no paths to follow in the twilight-lit forest but he managed to worm and squeeze his way through bushes and vines that tried to hang on to every inch of his body. The receding sound of pursuit told him that whoever was after him was having more trouble with the dense, jungle-like growth than he was with his new and improved skinny body. He looked at the hand that was covering the wound in his shoulder. It dripped thick arterial blood. Shit! 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 He gripped his shoulder and turned, grimacing, and wanted to shout, You're all fucking insane! He settled for whispering, Idiots! He always suspected that Eleanor was a bit weird, and Joshua had seemed a little out there for a while now. But Rachel was his friend, more than his friend, or so he had thought. She's scared, that's all. He would be, too. Matt looked up at the darkening holes in the ceiling. Already it was like early evening. Soon it would be dark, 
and the thought of being trapped in this forest with the monstrous Greta creeping about with a huge knife scared the shit out of him. And then there was that weird, crawling face. Matt shuddered. Behind him, the light from the center of the forest was a little like a blue sunrise. So close, he thought. He had two options. Creep back and hope for a reconciliation, which might have been possible until Greta turned up. Or he could look for support elsewhere. Find Khaled. He hoped the Saudi and Captain Okembu were alive, but they'd been with Greta, and now he had his doubts. People around me seemed to die, Rachel had inferred. He sighed. True, he thought, but somehow I don't think I'm the threat down here. He'd try to track as far as he could without using his light. It'd be a beacon for anyone trying to find him. He looked again at the blue glow, hoping that would be the group's focus for now. Matt stayed low and started to push through the underbrush, headed toward where he had last heard Khaled's gunfire. Khaled lay in the mouth of the cave. The slash at his chest had congealed, thankfully. But his head throbbed, and he thought his ankle might also be sprained. None of that worried him now. The Saudi lay still, watching more of the tendrils drop from the ceiling. They gently felt along his entire body, tapping, caressing, but not gripping yet. Perhaps whatever the thing was, it preferred live prey, and a corpse was of little interest. He tried to calm his breathing, and also tried not to look at where the thing was pushing more of itself from the ceiling. He had read somewhere that starfish actually push their stomachs outside their gut, so they can start digesting food that was too big to take inside their bodies. He shuddered. It was growing darker, but he could still see that the thing was emerging above him like a pulsating red sack. A single round eye popped open, looked at its surroundings, and then examined him. Another eye opened beside it, then another, and another. Like a spider, Joshua had said. They had eight eyes, didn't they? Khaled could have let his sanity slip, but instead he looked away and tried to think of a plan to extricate himself from under this monstrous thing. He eased in a huge breath, feeling the sharp jabs of pain. He'd been hurt before. He'd fallen from a horse, had trained in unarmed combat, and been knocked down many times, and he'd survived numerous assassination attempts on him and his family by bomb, gun, knife, and poison. Sometimes it was one's will alone that made some men survive and some fall. Khaled tensed his muscles, and using his good foot and both hands, began to ease himself backwards. He slid about an inch, then another, and felt the brittle bones of other animals crackle beneath him. One of the tendrils alighted on his chest and tapped for a moment before resting on the sticky blood. Khaled was revolted as the thing felt spiny against his skin and probably had rough hairs on the long, boneless arm. It reeled back up to disappear into the sack, tasting me. He guessed. Forgive me, my prince, he thought. I have failed you. The tendril came back and began to move higher, stopping again, this time on the center of his chest. Did it perhaps detect the faint heartbeat there, he wondered. It did, found him alive, and attacked. The thin, questing tendrils were withdrawn and the thick attack tendrils dropped down and began to encircle his limbs. He cried out, and in fear and frustration tried to scramble free, but in doing so was immediately enmeshed. The power of the thing was phenomenal, and as the coils tightened, the pain was unbearable. Khaled! Never had his name sounded so sweet. Professor! He eased his head around. Quickly! 
Matt poked his head inside the cave and recoiled. He immediately saw the Saudi's predicament. He had a knife, but it was a lot smaller than Okembu's, and if he attacked with that, his body start to tremble as he remembered a similar horror trying to pull him into the ceiling of a cave. It wanted to drag him into that abomination. Matt had an urge to simply turn and run. He did. Matt sprinted to the forest, grabbed the biggest, meanest branch he could find, and then turned back to the small cave. He didn't want to pause or stop or even think at all about what he needed to do, as that would allow the freezing fear to creep over him. He simply charged into the cave, yelling a war cry, and smacked the branch over and over into the hanging bag, the coils, and the alien eyes. There was a squeal and a splash of inky blood, and Khaled was momentarily loose. Matt grabbed his shoulders and roughly pulled him free. Matt didn't stop until he was twenty feet from the cave, and then he collapsed. The two men lay together, both breathing hard. Matt felt his racing heartbeat slow to a gallop. He turned. So how's your day been? Khaled began to laugh, but it broke down into a painful cough. He held his neck as he turned to Matt. This, my friend, is one of the times in my life that I regret my religion does not allow me to drink. Matt sat up and pulled the Saudi Arab up with him. What happened? No, forget that. I've already run into Greta. Where's Captain Okembu? Greta, yes. She attacked us, killed Captain Okembu before we even knew what she was up to, then tried to do the same to me. I fell into the grabber's cave, and I think she assumed that the creature would do the work for her, and it would have if you hadn't found me. He squeezed his eyes shut and ran both hands up through sweat-slicked hair. He looked up. And you? Matt seemed to think for a moment. She, Greta, came out of nowhere and attacked. I got the feeling she was under orders, Eleanor's. And the others? Khaled asked. I don't know. He looked away. They seem to be all working together. I ran, left them. He sighed. He was worried about Rachel now. Khaled stared. And did you find it, the wellspring? Matt felt the strength of his gaze and looked into the man's dark eyes. No, but we were close to something. The others are probably there by now. Khaled reached forward to rub his ankle. How is it? Matt asked. Can you walk? Khaled nodded. Not broken, I think, but badly sprained. It will hurt like the devil, but I will walk on it. He turned and grinned. And if we come face to face with Greta, I'll damn well run on it. Matt tilted his head back to laugh, and then stood. He held out a hand. Khaled gripped it and got unsteadily to his feet, hopped for a moment as he tested it. Satisfied, he put more weight on it, but still had a hand on Matt's shoulder. What now? he asked. Matt looked back to the glow from the center of the jungle. We do what we set out to do. Get some answers. Let him go! Rachel tensed her shoulders. The tall woman froze but kept facing the jungle where Matt had disappeared. Greta, Eleanor smiled through her words. Leave him now, that's a good girl. You stabbed him. Joshua seemed in shock. He'll bleed to death. You know that's not true. You know he'll be fine, better than fine and in no time at all. Eleanor's eyes slid to the scientist. You want that too, don't you? Joshua turned to her and stared for several seconds before his head started to bob. Maybe. What the hell is wrong with you people? 
Rachel suddenly didn't recognize the group. He was our friend. Greta turned from the rapidly darkening wall of the forest to face Rachel. She squared her shoulders, straightening and towering over the FBI woman. Rachel turned side on and held her gun loosely in her hand. She stared at the woman from under lowered brows. She'd been in standoffs before. The first few moments were key to working out the power dynamics. Greta's eyes were like glass, empty windows to a vacant soul. Her formidable jaw was set. Rachel held the woman's gaze. Who the fuck said you could attack anyone? And where are Khaled and Captain Okembu? Rachel continued to grip the gun hard. Greta knows to protect me, Eleanor said evenly. She probably thought I was being attacked. By Professor Kearns? Rachel's eyes went from Eleanor back to Greta. And where's the rest of your team? They got separated, of course. Eleanor's tone was amused. And? Rachel kept her eyes on Greta, liking both the women less by the second. Did you find a way out? No, Greta said, placing the large knife back in its scabbard. She went to kneel by Eleanor. Hey, I'm still talking to you. Rachel raised the gun. I haven't finished with you yet. Don't antagonize her, Agent Bromelow. I think you might end up biting off more than you can chew. Eleanor grinned. Rachel shook her head as she examined the hulking woman. Who the fuck is she? What the fuck is she? Eleanor stroked Greta's short and wiry gray hair. I already told you. I adopted her in East Germany in the sixties. She smiled down at the adoring woman. She was one of their test subjects for their performance-enhancing drugs regime. State Plan 14.25, they called it. She could have been a champion hammer thrower, weightlifter, or anything she wanted. But they rejected her, just because she had a few psychological imbalances. She turned to Rachel. Where they saw a potential monster, I saw a potential friend. She needs to answer some questions right now. Rachel's teeth were bared. You're not the authority here, Agent Bromelow, Eleanor said with a note of boredom in her voice. Besides, you're not going to shoot anyone. She whispered to Greta, and then climbed once again onto the woman's back, like some sort of baby simian. Now I suggest we push on and see what it is just above this rise. I'm ready, Joshua said, turning away. What? Rachel let her arms drop to her sides. Are you shitting me, Joshua? Khaled and Okembu are missing, and this woman comes back to us and immediately stabs Professor Kearns, and you're okay with that? I have no reason to doubt her, he shrugged. And you know there was something weird about Kearns. I didn't trust him, and I saw that you didn't either. That doesn't mean we should abandon him, Rachel said firmly. She chanced a look at the foliage, wondering how far away Matt could be. Well, you won't find him blundering off into the jungle, said Eleanor. If he's got any brains, he'll find his own way to the pool and meet us there. He wants to see it as much as we do. Rachel could feel the muscles in her jaw begin to twitch, and she went to raise the gun again. Oh, put it away, dear. Eleanor's eyes twinkled as she motioned up the hill. If you want to wander off and get killed by yourself, be my guest. Doctor, shall we? Greta still eyed her with cold amusement. Rachel had been an agent for over eight years and had seen some fucked up stuff in her life. But right now, she'd take any of that over having this woman behind her. She held out an arm. After you. Eleanor faked a smile. Joshua, you get to take the lead, dear boy. You've got a promotion. Joshua snorted and turned to clamber up the steep incline. Greta gave Rachel one more glance before climbing as well. 
Greta gripped a hanging branch and pulled both herself and Eleanor up onto some rocks. They were about twenty feet from a higher ledge, with the glow emanating from its top. For now it was still hidden behind a dense stand of thick trees, but would only take them a few minutes to reach. Joshua almost ran up the slope, before stopping and turning. In here! He only waited a second or two more, before spinning and pushing through the trees. Greta, with Eleanor Van Helling still clinging to her back, barged in after him, and Rachel followed, easing herself in. The trees had grown up to form a canopy over the top of a glowing sapphire-colored pool of water. Rachel stopped and stared. It was the most beautiful thing she had ever seen. The pool was a long oval shape, about a hundred feet in length, and so clear it was hard to tell if it was inches or dozens of feet deep. The ghost of a mist lifted from its surface, and Rachel could feel its warmth against her cheeks. She took a few more steps closer and stood by a chest-high pile of rocks that was one of many that were stacked or tumbled every dozen feet or so. Joshua pointed. More writing. There was a dark obelisk at one end of the pool, with more of the Chaldaic script on its face. I can't read it. He gave them a lopsided grin. Where's Matt Kearns when you need him, huh? He reached up to grab at a tree branch, examining the leaves. These are different to the others in the forest, and their roots are actually feeding from the water. Of course they are, Eleanor cackled. Do either of you even know what type of wood Noah built his ark from? Joshua shook his head slowly. Nope, can't say I ever gave it too much thought. No, wait, actually, zero thought. Idiot. She grinned as she looked at the trees surrounding the pool. Gopher, Rachel said softly. Matt told us. The old woman's eyes moved to Rachel standing slightly apart from them. Yes, gopher would. Eleanor's eyes narrowed. In Genesis 6.14, it says that Noah was to build the ark from gopher wood but it's a word for a type of wood not known around the time of the Bible or even in biblical Hebrew. However, there is an expression in ancient Babylonian of Gushure es irini, which translates to cedar beams. Rachel frowned. You suddenly seem to know a lot about the Ark, Mrs. Van Helling. There are no cedar forests growing in Africa, and hasn't been for thousands of years. She laughed hoarsely. But there are stories of it growing in great forests after the flood. The African cedar, Juniperus procera, was a tall tree with berry-like cones that were blue-black, like giant fruits. She looked up at the trees. Just like these. I see. And these are the last remnants of those ancient cedar forests. The seeds perhaps washed down here in the floods. Joshua followed her gaze. No, something far more fantastic than that. She whispered in Greta's ear, and the big woman helped Eleanor slide from her back. The ark was cedar. It came to rest here. She looked up at the ceiling. If we could see the roof, I think we might find it was man-made constructed over this vast cavern. Just like the monastery Khaled told us about, Rachel looked up, but saw nothing but a starless black. As the Ark settled in its secret place around four thousand five hundred years ago, and the waters drained away, the last of the holy flood lay in its belly. Its mighty cedar beams took root. They lived again. She grinned her eyes wide and fixed on the water. You want to know what happened to the ark? She waved a hand over the pool. Here it is. Rachel turned, looking again at the shape of the pond and the surrounding wall of trees. If you squinted, you could see that the pond was long and hull-shaped, 
and the stand of trees could even be imagined as the ribbing of the gunwale of a large ship. This is the ark, Joshua scoffed. This entire place is the ark. Its life-giving force exploded into all this. The old woman closed her eyes, hugging herself. And when God's wrathful waters receded, the last of them shall be a well of tears he has wept for the dead. And in its depths there will be no more death. Eleanor opened her eyes. Do you know what that is from? She giggled softly. My dear, sweet, stupid Clarence. He sent me that translation seventy-five years ago just before he disappeared. The only worthwhile thing he ever did. Her face grew hard. He was supposed to send for me. Joshua crossed to the pool edge and knelt. He quickly searched pouches and pockets until he found an empty vial and equipment. He uncapped the vial, scooped some of the water and lifted it. In his other hand he held a magnifying glass to his eye. Yes, he nodded and grinned. Yes, they're there. I can see them, almost invisible. They look like glass fibers, but they're there. Good. Eleanor turned to her big companion. Help me now one last time, my faithful Greta. The huge woman picked her up like an infant and walked with her to the edge of the water. Rachel felt disgust. This is what you've always wanted, isn't it? From the time you first started using us, you've wanted this. Isn't that right, Eleanor? Of course. Eleanor's wrinkled face was flushed. Rachel backed up. It didn't matter who got killed, who got hurt. We were all expendable pawns. Yes, again, dear. Eleanor ignored her now, as Greta started to carefully peel the old woman out of her clothing. Joshua turned away, but Rachel watched as the emaciated frame of the near-skeletal woman was revealed. She wore no bra as her breasts had long ago dried and flattened to little more than flaps against her chest. Greta finished by pulling down her underwear. Greta then took the tiny woman under the arms, lifted, and lowered her into the pool, easing her down like she was laying her in a warm bath. Eleanor squeezed her eyes shut and sunk down, mouth open, until her head disappeared below the brilliant blue water. Rachel and Joshua watched, as the water seemed to fizz and bubble around her. For some reason she was reminded of those images of the piranha-filled rivers in the Amazon, when some animal wanders into a school of the hungry fish, sat with her eyes closed, breathing in and out deeply, and perhaps waiting for her heartbeat to slow. Rachel stared with her mouth agape, and after a moment covered it with a hand. Holy shit! Joshua put both hands to his head. I don't fucking... His mouth continued to work, but no more words came. Eleanor sat with her head back, long golden tresses tumbling over her slender shoulders, and her eyes still closed. There was a beatific smile on her angular and striking features. After another moment... She raised a hand to her face, running her fingertips down over the cheekbone and tight jawline. She began to giggle. Why should youth be wasted on the young? She turned, opening luminous blue eyes. Eleanor got slowly to her feet and turned, arms wide. Joshua's mouth broke into a wide smile, and Rachel was sure the man stuck his chest out a little. Even Rachel was struck by the woman's sexiness, beauty, and raw animal attractiveness. Rachel hadn't ever used the term goddess before, but now that's what Eleanor was. Beside her, Greta fell to her knees and clutched hands to her chest before they moved toward Eleanor, not touching, but just hovering inches from her flesh. Her eyes were moist and her chin quivered. 
Never before had Rachel seen such adoration in another human being. Eleanor reached out and placed a hand atop the woman's head, stroking it as one might a favored pet. She turned to Joshua, her smile widening to show a line of perfect teeth. You're right. The pool was infected. What a terrible thing. She smiled as she examined one long, slender arm. And it all belongs to me now. Chapter 21 Matt and Khaled crept through the forest, staying low as they approached the soft blue glow. I can hear voices, Matt whispered. Khaled nodded and kept as quiet and low as he could on an ankle that was obviously as painful as hell. Matt got down on his belly and started to squirm forward on his elbows. He heard Khaled grunt as he did the same. Together they came up over the rise and peered through the thick foliage. Joshua and Rachel stood facing him on one side of a magnificent pool of sapphire-blue water. It made him want to dive in immediately. In fact, it was more than just the multiple abrasions, the heat and dirt that coated him, that made him desire the water. But every fiber of his being seemed to be screaming at him to enter it, drink from it, and become one with it. He knew he'd seen it before, in his dreams. The blue liquid was magnetic, its siren call almost impossible for him to resist. It took all his self-control to tear his eyes away and focus on the people. The large form of Greta had her back to them and stood motionless, as another figure, still obscured by her broad frame, seemed to be keeping their attention. There's the monster, Khaled hissed. I have a score to settle with that one. Yeah, she tried to open me up as well. Matt's eyes narrowed. So wait in line. Greta stepped aside, revealing the hidden figure, and Matt couldn't help his breath catching in his chest. It was a naked woman, magnificent in her beauty. Oh, my God, Matt whispered. I've seen her before. She is a goddess, Khaled breathed. Yes, she is. Matt frowned, craning forward. No, it can't be. I think that's... Who? Khaled moved aside more of the fronds in front of him. Eleanor Van Helling. Matt stared. The old hag? Khaled squinted back at the figure. Impossible. They did it. They found it. The fountain of youth. He couldn't help grinning. It's real. It's damn well real. I never really expected it to be true. Neither did the prince. Khaled blinked several times. And now, Eleanor Van Helling is restored. His mouth turned down. But God does not reward the evil with such gifts. Matt then saw the obelisk at the end of the pool. Hey, do you still have your field glasses? Khaled pulled them from a pouch at his hip and handed them to Matt, who brought them to his eyes. As he expected, it was Chaldaic script. He whispered the words, Those who are chosen must choose. Those who take have everything taken. What does that mean? Khaled looked at him in the darkness. Matt shook his head. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm translating it wrong. Sounds like a warning. The Saudi turned back to the pool. Yes, it does. Matt watched Joshua nod as something was said to him. He held up the small vial in his hand that contained some of the blue glowing liquid. While they watched, he brought it to his lips and upended it. Looks like he just voted to join the club, Matt said. Go ahead, Eleanor said. Besides, there will be no more drinking from the pool now. You may be the last common man I allow ever, she giggled. I can choose who to bestow this gift upon, she giggled again, 
and clasped her hands together, will be gods among mere mortals. The huge Greta grunted, and Eleanor eased around, her brows turning down in a pitying expression. And you, of course, my darling, faithful Greta, in time. She turned back to Joshua and nodded. Go on, bottoms up. Joshua held up the vial. This is madness. He looked at it for a moment or two. This place, it must be making us hallucinate. Don't, Rachel said. I'm, I'm only doing it to record my sensations, like a test subject of sorts. He looked at the glowing blue vial, smiled dreamily, and then put it to his lips. Rachel saw his throat work as he downed it in a single swallow, eager to become part of Eleanor's band of immortals. He closed his eyes, breathing calmly, as a smile began to spread over his face. Rachel's forehead furrowed as she watched all the abrasions, bruises, and cuts on his face first lighten, close, and then vanish. Joshua took off his glasses, blinked, and then began to grin. He dropped the spectacles to the ground. I feel marvelous, Eleanor finished for him. She turned to the hulking Greta. Shoot him in the chest. Greta lifted the gun without hesitation and fired, hitting Joshua dead center. He was blown backwards into the dirt, sitting there in stunned silence, one hand to the bloom of blood spreading across his ribs. He flopped back dead. Greta saw Rachel flinch, and she immediately turned the gun on her. Drop your weapon, Eleanor said evenly. Now. Rachel hesitated, wondering if it was possible to draw and fire before the large woman put a hole in her chest, unlikely in the extreme she knew. My dear, if I wanted you dead, you'd be laying at my feet right now. Now drop it, or I'll ask Greta to blow a little hole in your gun arm and then take the weapon from you. She never misses. Drop it. Last chance. The muzzle of Greta's gun moved to point at the meat of Rachel's shoulder. Rachel growled through gritted teeth and then let her gun fall to the ground. Beside her, Joshua groaned. Huh? Her head whipped round. The man had been shot through the heart at close range. The muscular organ was tough, but would have been obliterated. He should be as dead as dead can be. Rachel rushed to crouch beside him. Joshua sat up, coughed blood, and gripped his chest. Back away, my dear, Eleanor said lightly. I want to see something. Joshua coughed again but then took a deep, juddering breath. Fucking ouch! Eleanor tittered like a teenager. I'm not surprised it hurt. After all, you were just shot through the heart. How do you feel? Fuck you. I bet you'd like to, but I'm well out of your league now, little boy. She smiled and folded her slender arms across her perked breasts. It was just part of a test, my dear. It seems will be very hard to kill. Almost impossible, really. She grinned and let her eyes slide to her large servant. Almost. Now for the second part of our little test, Eleanor said. Greta, you know what to do. Greta turned back to the sitting scientist and advanced on him quickly. She gripped his hair with one hand and with the other she drew the long silver knife and began to rapidly saw through his neck. Joshua thrashed, and blood fountained. Rachel felt like she was going to faint, and Joshua's scream chilled her blood. Or perhaps it was her own screaming that she heard. In a few seconds, the man gurgled one last time, and then the woman stepped aside to let the headless body fall back on the ground. She held the head up facing Eleanor. The woman stared at it, concentrating intently on the still twitching features. After another few moments, the nerves quietened, 
and the dead face grew slack. Eleanor nodded. Good. You can dispose of it now, my dear. He's dead. For good this time. Why? Rachel swallowed the bile in her mouth and tried not to inhale the hot, coppery smell of fresh blood. Yes, I wondered that as well, my dear. Eleanor looked bemused. When they removed my beloved Clarence's head, it made me wonder why. Now we know. It seems we aren't invulnerable after all. Removing the head will finish us for good. Greta dropped the head next to the body. It thumped to the ground, tongue lolling. The huge woman was devoid of emotion as she stood stock still, with her forearms drenched red like a ghastly pair of ballroom gloves. Rachel wished she still had her gun, as she knew that one word from Eleanor and Greta would be sawing at Rachel's neck in an instant. Eleanor finally stepped from the pool and began to don her old clothing. She smirked at how tight some of the items were, the top stretching impossibly across her full breasts. She looked up, holding her arms out. How do I look? She turned slowly, her beatific face an angelic mask hiding the evil within. My beautiful mistress, Greta whispered, her eyes glowing with love, lust, and worship. She reached out to stroke Eleanor's golden tresses. Eleanor then faced Rachel. No words from you, Agent Bromelow. You used to have so much to say. Rachel looked around, searching for an escape route should she need one. Why am I still alive? Eleanor shrugged. One of you had to stay alive to help me get home. It just turned out to be you, hmm? And then you... She bit off her words. There was no way the woman would let her live and trust her to keep the precious secret. As soon as they were out of danger, she'd have the giantess remove her head. Yes? Eleanor asked. Rachel smiled. I was going to say, and you look great. Eleanor nodded and went to turn away, but then froze. Greta came to stand slightly in front of her, squaring her shoulders. In one hand was Rachel's gun, and in the other the bloody blade she had just used on Joshua. Rachel followed their gaze and saw a tall, bearded man standing near the obelisk at the end of the pool. She had no idea how long he had been there watching them, but if he had seen what Greta had done, then the word savages might be on his mind. He held up a hand, the palm toward them, in a universal gesture of greeting. Eleanor smiled in return and half turned to Greta. This pool belongs to us. He must be one of them, so we'll need to take his head. Matt and Khaled had watched with horror as Greta had decapitated Joshua. It had happened so fast and unexpectedly that neither man could have done anything other than rush into the path of either Greta's gun or knife. But it was the brutality and ferociousness that had shocked Matt and Khaled so greatly. The large woman never hesitated for a moment. She truly is a monster, Khaled breathed. Yes, and obviously trained to do Eleanor's bidding. It's no wonder she keeps her so close. Matt tore his eyes away, and then was jolted by the strange new figure. Hey, look, Matt motioned to the far end of the glowing blue pool. There's someone there. Who the hell is that? Khaled asked. Matt watched as Eleanor carefully took the gun from Greta and kept it behind her back. The huge woman stood stone still, the long blade still dripping with Joshua's blood down at her side. The bearded figure looked at each of the three women, and then up at the obelisk. He laid a hand on one of the chest-high stacks of rock and started to speak and Matt strained to hear. The man started with Hebrew, and then switched to German, then Russian, before changing smoothly to English. 
As a language expert, Matt marveled at the fluency of each of the tongues he used, as each one was without the hint of an accent. Why have you come? His voice was stentorian, powerful, and commanding. Eleanor bowed slightly. We only came to seek knowledge. I am Eleanor Van Helling, of the New York Van Hellings. My husband was here, Clarence Van Helling. Perhaps you met him? She waited a moment, until it was clear the man was not going to respond. And whom am I addressing, sir? The man looked her up and down. I see you came to seek more than knowledge. You would take, and you would kill for your own personal gain. His expression dropped. Your soul is as black as the pit of hell itself. Eleanor snorted. No need to be rude, she smiled. And you are? He held his arms wide. I am just a servant, a keeper of the last of God's great secrets. His voice lowered. And a defender against those who would seek to steal it, destroy it, or debase it. Eleanor lifted one long arm, looking at the silken flesh. Steal it? No, it was a gift, and one I gratefully accept. Join us. The man lifted an arm and beckoned over their heads. Rachel turned, following his gaze. She looked along the wall of trees where Matt and Khaled were concealed. Oh, shit. Matt got down. The man looked almost cheerful. Come, please, Khaled ibn al-Sudairi and Professor Matthew James Kearns. Come out. You have nothing to fear from me. What? Rachel stared now. Well, do we go down or run and hide? Matt asked. We've run enough, Khaled said, and got to his feet. Be ready. Greta is the real danger, and she can't kill us both at once. We jump her? Matt also got to his feet. If we have to. Khaled then Matt came out of the foliage. Eleanor threw her head back and laughed. You're both harder to kill than a pair of roaches. Rachel embraced Matt, shaking her head. Thank God you're alive. I'm so sorry. I should have trusted you. She then put a hand on Khaled's shoulder and leaned closer. She's already ordered Greta to kill Joshua. We know, Khaled said. Welcome, Matthew. Eleanor sneered. You don't know who I am, she smiled cruelly. I agree this is one secret that should be kept, and as long as I benefit, I promise to keep it for you, although I may share it with a few of the better people I have in mind. Noah's eyes were hawk-like in their intensity. I know who you are, Eleanor Van Helling, and what you are capable of. His eyes slid to the tall Greta who seemed like an attacked dog, barely held back on its leash. He smiled sadly. And I know you have ordered this pitiful being to kill many times on your behalf. His eyes then blazed with a dark fire. Yes, I know who you are, and I know what you are. You are dust, you are nothing at all, and you will fall. He looked up at the obelisk again pointing to the ancient script. Those who are chosen must choose. Those who take have everything taken. Eleanor smiled thinly. Oh, I think you'll find me a little harder to deal with. She lifted the gun from behind her back. Really, you? Noah held his arms wide. Alexander of Macedonia, King Xerxes of Persia, Caligula, Napoleon, Adolf Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong. Great people of history have sought out this secret, and some have even found it. But all of them are dust now. He reached down and scooped up some of the water in his palm. He looked down into it. When the great waters finally receded, 
we found that there were more things that survived than my sons, their wives, and the few animals. He smiled. Sometimes the tiniest of us are the most powerful. He looked up at them from under lowered brows. Like sin, be careful that what you desire most doesn't end up consuming you. He brought the liquid to his lips and drank. Once you have partaken of the water, you must continue to take it. His eyes went momentarily to Matt, and he nodded. Lectures over. Eleanor lifted her gun and fired twice. Whether or not the bullet struck was unknown, as Noah vanished into the thick foliage like smoke. Khaled crouched and then lay flat. Matt pulled Rachel down as Eleanor fired into the foliage. Stop it, you fool, Matt yelled, and climbed on top of Rachel, who battered him away. Get off me, Rachel said, who probably thought she was better able to protect them than he was. Eleanor turned toward Matt, pointing, her teeth bared. Greta, cut his head off. There's not room for two of us. She then turned back to keep her eyes on the foliage trying to find Noah. Greta faced Matt, her jaw set. Khaled went after Eleanor, but she snapped the gun around and fired, forcing Khaled to dive into the bushes. Matt slowly got to his feet and watched as the huge woman's brawny forearm bulged as she regripped the long blade. Beside him, Rachel also got to her feet pushed Matt behind her, and then got into a combat stance, knees bent and up on her toes. Greta came in fast, and Rachel kicked out with a lunge kick to the woman's midsection. But with the rushing mass of the larger woman, it only succeeded in forcing Rachel back and off balance. Rachel straightened and came again, this time using a looping right cross to the woman's chin. Greta put her head down quickly, Taking Rachel's fist to her forehead, Matt heard bones crunch, and Rachel grunted in pain. Greta then swung an arm with a bicep like a Christmas ham that caught Rachel across the temple and batted her away like she weighed nothing. The FBI agent flew back into the bushes, collided with a tree trunk, and lay still. Greta then pulled out her knife again and turned to face Matt. Obviously saving the blade for me, he thought, relieved that she didn't use it on Rachel. He held his hands out before him and stepped back. Just wait a minute, Greta. He kept backpedaling, hands still waving in front of him. He glanced quickly over his shoulder at the foliage, contemplating another dash into its green cover. There was a sudden rush of movement as Khaled charged from the brush, and brought a thick branch down across the huge woman's neck and shoulders. There was a grunt, and Greta went to her knees. Yes! Matt gritted his teeth, fist balled. Khaled yelled and swung again, this time the branch splintering against the back of Greta's head. The iron-gray curls masked her face, but slowly she lifted her head. Khaled shifted the branch in his hands. The Saudi's eyes blazed his fury unbound as he took his revenge on the murderous woman. Matt watched as Khaled raised the remains of the club high above his head. It was then he saw Greta's face, the mouth twisted in a smirk. Look out! Matt had barely yelled the words when Khaled's club swung down with all his might, but faster than he could have possibly anticipated. Greta shot an arm up and caught it in her fist. Her other hand moved in a blur, sinking the long silver blade deep into the Saudi's chest. Khaled looked shocked for a moment, his eyes wide and surprised. No! Matt howled in anguish. Greta grinned, and then rapidly pulled the blade free to immediately sink it in again. Khaled's face went slack, and he fell back like a small tree. He was dead before he hit the ground. Matt faced her, his fists balled. You bitch! He knew he was no fighter, but never before in his life 
had he wanted to kill someone so badly. Greta grinned. Blood had splashed her face, running into her mouth, and also coating her teeth. Combined with her dead eyes, she was a vision straight from hell, as she came quickly at Matt. Shit! Matt quickly picked up the remains of Khaled's branch, and held it two-handed out in front of him, like a gate. He'd seen the lack of effect it had on her before, so knew he needed to outthink her rather than outfight her. Matt then caught sight of his own arms. They were stick-like, with barely any meat left on the bones. His clothing sagged and nearly fell from his body, he was so thin. It was the worms, he knew that for sure now, and knew that they'd continue to consume him until he was a living skeleton, only animated by the revolting parasitic life inside him. Behind them, Eleanor looked exasperated. Just cut his fucking head off! She screamed, the brutal words at odds with her angelic face. Greta squared her shoulders. You can't kill me, you know. He held the log before him. Greta looked from Matt to Joshua's head, and then back and into his eyes. Her mouth twisted in a familiar smirk. He got the message. Of course she could. The big woman adjusted her grip on the knife, and then began to advance. Matt held the log up and tried to picture her next steps and how he would respond. He bet she would come fast, giving him two options, block, swing, fight, or throw, turn, run. Fuck it. He knew he'd have to stay. Rachel was as good as dead if he left. Ha! He fainted with the log but all Greta did was lower her brow and start to accelerate. Matt backpedaled, but caught an ankle and fell back, slamming against one of the chest-high stacks of rock. It moved. He sat on the ground and watched it all through Greta's changing expressions. Confusion switched to recognition, and then her broad, cruel features twisted into something he had never seen on her face. Fear. Matt chanced to look over his shoulder and saw the hulking mass rise up. The pile of rocks unfolded, reassembled itself into the massive creature he had seen at the church and that had snatched Saib into the pit. Massive yellow orbs blinked open. It was a Nephilim, a fallen one, the giants sent to be sentinels until the end of time. One tree-trunk-thick leg thumped down in front of Matt, and it reached forward a hand that closed over one half of Greta's torso. Unbelievably, she fought on, stabbing down with her knife, but whatever the creature was made of, the blade could not hope to penetrate the skin. Greta began to be lifted from her feet, and the creature stared with its huge, dispassionate yellow eyes into her face for a second or two before his hand closed. Matt grimaced and narrowed his eyes as he heard bones and cartilage compress and snap like bundles of twigs. Greta's scream turned into a wet gurgle, and her body flopped sideways over the compressed frame. The Nephilim dropped her, but then stamped down hard on her head. Greta! Eleanor's scream was barely heard, as the giant turned to Matt. He held up a hand to ward it off, and its huge yellow pupilless eyes stared deep into him. Words in Chaldaic floated over them. Noah had reappeared, and the creature turned to the man, and then instead of attacking Matt, it stepped over him, bent, and then folded itself back down until it looked once again like nothing more than a pile of dark rock. Eleanor's scream had turned into a furious howl, and she held Rachel's gun in two hands as she closed in on Noah. She began to fire, teeth bared and luminous blue eyes blazing. Bullets smacked into his chest, and he opened his arms wide. Those who take have everything taken. She continued to fire until the gun clicked on an empty chamber. Noah lowered his brow 
his lips moving. Matt heard the Chaldaic words again, tumbling over each other. They were ancient words, forceful and commanding, and spoken in their native form in the way they were meant to be. Matt concentrated on understanding him. He was calling, no, commanding, but not Eleanor. He was calling to something else. He now repeated one line over and over, back to the water. Eleanor's beautiful features were a mask of strain. Sweat broke out on her brow, glistening like tiny diamonds, and her body started to tremble. After another few seconds, one of her legs began to move, then the other. She ground her teeth, looking like she was trying to stop them. Eventually, she began to turn and walk robotically toward the glowing pool. Noah continued to chant in Chaldaic, his words deep and hypnotic. Back to the water. Back to the water. Back to the water. Eleanor came to the pool's edge and crushed her eyes shut. A small noise escaped from between her clamped teeth as she fought against her own body. It made no difference. She stepped in. Those who take have everything taken, Noah said softly. His face was furrowed by a look of deep sadness. Matt stared, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. In the water now, Eleanor seemed to shrink. Her magnificent high cheekbones became softer, plumper, and her jawline receded. Her eyes seemed to grow bigger in a round face whereas seconds before she had been tall and long of limb, now she had shrunk in her clothing, smaller and smaller. Eleanor began to cry, holding up her hands, wailing at each of the tiny fingers. She looked no more than eight years old, then six, then four, and on until she was nothing but a tiny, bald baby floating on the pile of clothing. And then that, too, disappeared. Matt could imagine the magic of the first cell division of life working in reverse, until perhaps there was nothing but a glistening egg and a single sperm. And then even the clothing dissolved as the water hissed and boiled around the small floating island for another moment. Matt got slowly to his feet. He had to use a hand to hold his trousers up, as there was no meat on his bones any more. Noah continued to watch the pool as it settled back to blue crystal tranquility. I have a story to tell you, Professor Matthew Kearns, and then I have a request. He went and dipped his hand in, cupping some of the liquid. This is so unreal. Matt went and crouched by Rachel, brushing dirt from her forehead. She moaned. You know it's real. Noah turned and crossed to Matt. Here, drink. Matt recoiled, but every fiber of his being knew he had to do it. He leaned forward, not able to control his own limbs, and his large head felt heavy on his thin neck. He sipped the water and almost immediately felt an explosion in his stomach that went to his chest and then head. Like magic, his skin inflated, turning a healthy pink hue. Matt sat back, blinking, feeling better than he had ever before in his life. He stared at the holy man. I'm sure I've seen you before. Perhaps. Noah lifted Greta's body and dragged it to the water, tossing it in. He did the same with Khaled and Joshua. The luminescent pool fizzed and bubbled around the corpses for a moment before it cleared. What the hell is in there? Matt felt his chest, fearing the worst. It's in me too now, isn't it? Not from hell, Matthew, Noah sighed, crossed to him and sat down on the ground. Matt cradled Rachel, who moaned again. A huge purple egg lumped her forehead. He lifted her head, but she still didn't open her eyes. She'll be fine, Noah said. He looked back to the pool. Once again, magnificently clear, luminescent blue, and inviting. 
This is all that remains of my once mighty ark. Its keel, its powerful beams, and all its saved creatures. He waved an arm around. This is where we came. He looked up. This is where we sought shelter after the great waters receded. The last of God's great flood cooled in the base of the ark. But there were others, Matt said. The priest in Canada, Father Xavier, and all those other names that he went under. It was the same man, wasn't it? He was here. Yes, of course. And you're right. Hundreds of names in hundreds of places before that. He sighed again. But as you suspected, all the same man. He looked up at Matt, his eyes sad. And not just a priest. It was my second son, Japheth. Murdered, Matt said, by Clarence von Helling. Noah turned, looking a little bewildered. I don't know why. I sent Clarence and one other, with a message for my son. Something went wrong. Very wrong. They cut his head off, destroyed everything, Matt said, and then paused. One other. Noah nodded. George Bass, an explorer who went missing in 1803, and was brought to us here. I sent him to accompany Clarence. He nodded. They took some of the water with them, enough to make it back across the water to Japheth, deliver the message, and then return. And instead, Clarence killed him and destroyed everything. Matt couldn't understand it, and clearly Noah didn't either. Noah's mouth lifted in a crooked smile. Japheth never wanted to stay here. Even as a boy, he was strong-headed and rebellious. He looked up. And one who often walked among you, unnoticed. Matt thought about the idea of these immortals walking among them. It unsettled him. And on the mountaintop in Turkey, another son, Shem? Yes. Noah's eyes seemed to lose more light. Shem. Not as strong as Japheth. After so long he grew weary and decided on the eternal sleep. I always hoped he would one day regain his spirit, but... He looked at Matt. All gone now. My sons, their wives, my descendants spread far and wide, and not knowing who they really are. He drew in a deep breath and exhaled slowly. There is only my loving wife, Emzara, and me, left of the riders in the ark. I knew it would happen one day. A line appeared between his brows. That is why I try and gather good and strong souls like you to help me. But who killed... Matt studied the still youthful-looking face of a man supposed to be 4,500 years old. Clarence and the two families in Canada. And where is George Bass? Noah's eyes narrowed. Mr. Bass is missing. But he must return soon if the water stored in the church is destroyed. If not, he may be consumed. Matt shuddered. Noah seemed to think for a moment or two. Poor Clarence. He looked up. But I thought it was the police who killed him. That is why your FBI became involved. No, Matt said. The Borgia. Matt's eyes narrowed. They do your bidding, don't they? Noah shook his head, frowning deeply. The Borgia, the Brutians, the Meshans, and many other groups that remain hidden. But they would never do this, ever. And yes, they follow orders, mine, and want Shems and Japheths to keep us safe here. But they could do it, if you or someone ordered them to. Matt's voice took on an edge. They're killers. They even attacked us at Prince Najib's compound. Noah straightened. If they were so ordered, but that order would never be given. In fact, their age-old role was coming to an end, and the reason I called Japheth back. He clasped his large hands together. 
Since we first found we had been given the gift of immortality, we decided to keep it secret. We had already seen such evil over the ages, and imagined a world where the likes of Caligula, Genghis Khan, or Adolf Hitler lived for a thousand years. We knew there would be nothing left of the goodness of man. I don't think we're all bad. Matt leaned his forearms on his knees. Conversely, imagine a world where people like Abraham Lincoln, Gandhi, or Martin Luther King live forever. I'm not necessarily a supporter of the concept of living forever, but think of the good that would come of that. Yes, this is what I came to believe as well. Noah reached out a hand and gripped Matt's shoulder. I too think good would win out, and the others here finally agreed. What? You wanted everyone to be immortal? Matt gaped. Yes, for as long as they wanted it, Noah said. Like you said, think of the good things mankind could accomplish. Short-term thinking would be eradicated. Wars would be futile. Good works would never have to end. Matt frowned as his mind worked. But if you lived forever, you would have seen everything, done everything. Boredom would drive you insane. Noah opened his arms wide. Then you could visit the stars. Matt shook his head. Crime and punishment would be meaningless. If good works could live forever, then like you just suggested, so too could the wrong ones. It might create an everlasting hell on earth. Noah smiled. The gift could be withheld from those that debase it, or taken from them. Remember, we are immortal, not invulnerable. I know. Matt pulled in a cheek. But then who decides who is worthy and who is not? You? All I'm saying is we would still need laws, Matthew. Noah's smile broadened. Your wisdom is exactly how I imagined it. Noah gripped Matt's forearm and shook it. This is exactly why I need you. I've been following you, looking over you for years. You know evil, Matthew. You have fought it before in many of its forms. You have courage, intelligence, and honor. You have what we need to show all of them what we can achieve. So you infected me to recruit me. Matt lifted his hand to look at the fingers. He flexed them. The ones that were broken only hours before, now all strong. In New York, I survived the bomb attack. I remember someone after. Was it you? It's why you survived the attack, all the attacks. I chose to have you saved. It's why you have been dreaming of this place, seeing what I see. The waters now connect you with here, and with me. It is a gift, Matthew. And if I don't keep drinking the water from the fountain, then the worms will consume me. Matt sat down and held his head for a moment. This is no gift. It's an addiction. No, a curse. An immortality curse. And now I'm doomed to remain here as well. Would it be so bad? Noah waved an arm out of the lush growth surrounding them. A colored bird alighted in the foliage of a tree, to cock its head and peer at them from one eye for a moment, before squawking its displeasure and then flitting away. This is my home, my paradise, and my garden of Eden. The world outside is tearing itself down and decaying from within. It needs to be steered in the right direction. You can help, or sit back and watch it destroy itself, and everything you love with it. I'd be trapped, Matt shook his head. Noah sighed. No, you wouldn't. A small sip of the water will sustain you for weeks. Many have left here already. Some return, some do not. It's their choice. Think of it. A world without pain, disease, infirmity. Matt nodded as he continued to examine his hand. Only moments ago it looked like parchment stretched over bone. Now it was young again. Would that be so bad? 
he wondered. A world without pain, disease, infirmity, or death, and even a restorer of vitality. I guess the knowledge you could gather would be immense. He looked up. The old become new. The crippled could walk again. Noah's smile faded a little. It has its limits, Matthew. George Bass lost a hand in an accident aboard his ship before he drank from the pool. It never grew back. Oh, well. Matt smiled sadly, but then his brow furrowed as he remembered something. His head snapped up. Lost a hand? Was it his left one? Why, yes. Noah tilted his chin. Matt's mind spun. But the body in the church, it was missing its left hand. Then it must have been George Bass. What? Noah's eyes blazed. That means... Matt was grabbed by the hair and dragged backwards. It means I'm still in time to stop you. The voice was deep and commanding. Matt looked straight up into the darkest eyes he had ever seen, but eyes he recognized from the old photograph in the church at Fort Severn. Javeth, Matt gasped. Matt's neck was laid bare, and a long blade appeared in the man's other hand. He faced Noah, who was now on his feet. So, my son, you came back after all. Noah started to walk slowly forward. You followed him. You left me no choice, Japheth responded. Matt strained in a grip that was impossible to break. He looked up. It was you all along, who tried to kill me with the grenade, and have been commanding the Borgia. Japheth looked down. And we would have succeeded until the Nephilim detected the life-givers in your body. His jaws clenched momentarily. You were the last piece he needed, the communicator who could talk to the world in their own tongues. You were to be Noah's voice, his pawn. Matt struggled, his eyes going from the blade back up to the dark-eyed face. You killed Clarence, the family, the child. You're the murderer. Japheth's eyes were rock-steady. Unfortunate, but the secret must remain just that. His mouth was a thin line. At all costs. Javeth dragged Matt's head back again, and he looked to Noah. I warned you, this gift is too great to spray across the globe. They are not ready, and from what I have witnessed, they may never be ready. I think they are, and the world needs a miracle now more than ever. Noah edged closer. I don't wish to fight with you, my son. Japheth looked pained. But you would give me no choice if you continue on this path. Death is renewal. I think even Shem knew that at the end. We cannot allow the human race to stagnate. Children are its legacy, not an enduring population of morally decaying immortals, like we are. Noah now just watched the man, and Japheth pointed the blade at him. They would be like squabbling children, all wanting to be kings or gods. When you say a world without war, I think you would provoke a war that will end the world. They rush to build up their weapons of fire. It would be regrettable if they destroyed themselves, but it would be intolerable if they succeeded in also wiping out all life on earth. Japheth bared his teeth. It is all God's creation and you would have a hand in ending it. He looked down for a moment into Matt's eyes, before looking back up slowly. You may provoke another flood. Noah looked like he had been slapped, and his eyes widened. He seemed frozen for a few moments. Every year more people believe in nothing, Noah seemed to sag then perhaps the floods will truly be needed once again. Off to the side, Rachel groaned and began to stir. Noah raised his eyes, now wet, and lifted a single hand. I will hear you. 
Japheth let Matt go. This decision is too great to just be yours. Or yours, Noah said. One of our greatest strengths and our greatest weaknesses is a free will. He turned from Japheth to Matt. Then let Matthew make the decision. What? Matt's brows shot up. Japheth's eyes narrowed momentarily but then relaxed. Agreed. Noah turned and smiled benignly. Matthew, we can choose which path to take. I chose you to continue my work with me, but you don't have to choose to be part of it. Those who are chosen must choose, Matt said, and scrabbled over to Rachel to lift and cradle her. Yes, Noah straightened. What do you choose? Matt stared at the tall, bearded man. Matt liked the idea of never feeling the ravages of age, illness, or injury. But it wouldn't really be him anymore. Where was the thrill of life if the element of danger was removed? It would be like playing a game of chance, where you always knew the outcome. I choose to leave. Good, Japheth said softly, and only then seemed to relax. Noah sighed and clasped large hands together. I will be here in a year, in ten years, and in a hundred. You can choose to come back any time. I won't be back, Matt said. My life is out there. Today and tomorrow it might be. But maybe in a thousand tomorrows you may feel differently. The bearded man smiled. The world is changing. I know you feel it, too. So I can leave? But how? Matt asked. I can show you the way out. Noah got to his feet. But the worms, they'll consume me. You said so yourself. Matt rubbed both hands up through his hair, pushing it back off his face. That won't happen now, Noah said. Before Matt could reply, Rachel stirred, and he reached down to brush dirty hair from her eyes. Matt looked up. And she can come with me. Of course. Matt stared, trying to process all the information and the warning. You've been here so long. How come you don't succumb to the symbiotes? Noah looked briefly to the pool. The symbiotes are as much a part of me as I am of them. There is balance. They stay benign for a long time, but eventually they need the water. They need to return home. You control them? Matt asked. I saw what you did to Eleanor. Noah tilted his head as though listening. I... we understand each other. You can feel it now, too. I'm sorry. Matt meant it. But I don't want it. I choose to be me, normal again. Noah placed a hand on Matt's shoulder. If you change your mind. I won't, Matt said, trying to sound resolute. But he couldn't help feeling a tiny hint of regret. Noah looked into his eyes deeply. And Matt could swear the man was reading his mind. Perhaps he found a seed of doubt there as the corners of his mouth lifted a fraction. As you wish. Noah began to whisper, and immediately Matt felt a wrenching of flesh from his toes to his scalp, and then his stomach exploded as a torrent of blue fluid burst forth from his lips. With only the glow of the sapphire pool it was hard to see, but he knew that the puddle at his feet wriggled with tiny life. Matt wiped his mouth. He immediately felt tired and sore all over. He looked up. That's it? Noah just smiled. He reached out a hand, and Matt gripped it in his own. He looked up at the fading sunlight beams making their way across the cavern. You must go now and make a start before the sun goes down. He continued to hold on to Matt's hand. We'll meet again, Matthew Kearns, 
After all, life is long. He grinned. For some of us, very long indeed. I don't know how you do it. Matt studied the man. The ennui must be crushing. It is for some. They leave and succumb on purpose. History is littered with those who seem to have long lifespans. But a life lived long must be lived sparingly and in the shadows. People fear what they don't understand, and people drive off or even kill what they fear. Both a gift and a curse, Matt said. Perhaps. Noah pointed to the end of the cavern. There is a cave that will lead you out. A hidden stone door will pivot. He stood. Don't worry, nothing will harm you. The Borgia might not let me. Matt turned to Japheth. Japheth shook his head. The Borgia will not trouble you now. Or ever. Noah looked sternly at his son, until Japheth nodded again. Rachel groaned, and Matt lifted her to her feet. She was still groggy. Noah touched her forehead. She won't remember a thing. He looked to Matt. And you must never tell anyone of this place or of our meeting. I won't, Matt promised. And I'm sorry, but I won't be coming back. Noah just smiled. Noah waited until they had left, before turning and nodding to each man and woman that appeared from the forest. He chose not to stay, a woman said. Noah nodded. A good man always refuses a gift the first time, but he'll be back. He turned to Japheth. I told you that there is honor among them. Perhaps. His dark eyes stared after Matt and Rachel. When there are more like him than not, then I'll believe they're ready. His eyes shifted to Noah. You told him he was purged. That's not possible. You made sure he'll return. It is possible. Noah's mouth curved into a smile. Mostly. Japheth shook his head. We are no better than them. He half bowed, and then slipped away into the forest. Noah then turned to the figures gliding from the lush green growth. Our work is done for now. He looked along each of the faces. It is time. The shining, smooth skin, the luminous eyes of youth, and broad shoulders now slumped in despair. Already? one asked. Noah nodded, and each but one turned away, stepping into the forest and vanishing. The last woman smiled. He'll return. But not yet, Emzara. Noah closed his eyes and held out his hands flat. And maybe not soon enough. The birds of the forest grew quiet. So did the hum of insects. And then even the slight breeze receded to nothing. From all around him, there came instead a hissing and popping, like water drops in a hot frying pan. Then the tallest of the trees began to tremble. As if the massive trees were being subjected to extreme heat, they began to melt. Around Noah the huge banyans, cedar and oak, began to shrink and drop, then the ferns and bushes beneath them. The birds on the tree limbs simply melted like colored wax to puddle on the ground. And beside Noah, Emzara stared for a moment, her smile drooping to one of sorrow, before she too dropped into a fizzing liquid joining up with the masses of fluid that wriggled with life. The vibrant colors faded to a milky soup that ran into the cracks and fissures in the rocks. Only Noah and the glowing pool remained. He was a solitary figure in a vast, dark, and empty cavern. Noah waded into the shimmering water and sunk down. The blue light immediately went out and it too started to drain. For a few seconds, there came the final pops and hisses of the receding biological material 
as it ran away, and then there was nothing but an enormous silent space. The Garden of Eden and its fantastic fountain of youth had hidden itself once again. Chapter 22 One of their jeeps sat waiting for Matt and Rachel when they came out of the caves. Matt stood in the empty desert, scanning the horizon. It seemed devoid of life, like an alien planet with no animals, birds, bandits, or even a breath of wind. Just silence. Rachel sat quietly for most of the trip, a dazed expression on her face. A few miles back, she had turned to him and touched his arm. What happened? She rubbed the lump on her forehead and frowned. I can't remember anything. He put his arm around her, and she slumped against him. There was a cave-in. We survived, but unfortunately, no one else did. Oh, God, no. She looked up at him. Did we find it, the wellspring? He looked out over the vast, dry desert. No, no. There was nothing to find, a dead end. It was all just a myth, after all. He reached across to stroke her forehead, and she eased back in the seat and closed her eyes. Time for us to go home. Author's Notes Many readers ask me about the background of my novels. Is the science real or fiction? Where do I get the situations, equipment, characters, or their expertise from? And just how much of any legend has a basis in fact? In the case of the Fountain of Youth, Noah's Ark, and the man himself, much is from the Christian Bible and other holy books. To some they are absolutes, to others they are just hearsay, legend, and allegorical tales. But as for the fountain of youth and longevity, there are still searches going on in remote places today. Perhaps the real breakthroughs in our quest for longer lives, or indeed immortality, will not come from some remote jungle, desert, or ice cap, but instead be made in a pristine laboratory, right around the corner from you, any day now. But before we look at some of my research, I'm including a new section called The Cutting Room Floor. These are some of the scenes that didn't make that cut. See what you think. The Cutting Room Floor Epilogue Six months later, Huntington Ingalls Industries, Newport News, Virginia the tall, bearded man sat in the wood-paneled office of H.I.I., the largest shipbuilding company in the United States. His immaculate three-piece suit was perfectly tailored and expensive, and his shoes so polished they reflected the overhead lights as tiny halos in the toes. He declined the offer of coffee and instead sipped from a sterling silver flask he had with him. He smiled at the room full of beaming executives. He capped the flask and slipped it into a breast pocket. I need you to build me a ship, the biggest one you can. He grinned at the hungry-looking executives. And money is no object. The Fountain of Youth Man, like all creatures on earth, is tethered to mortality. Having an end defines everything we do in life. But many of us would like more of the one thing we can't buy, steal, or bargain for. Life. Does something exist that can do it? Many in history have thought so. A mystical wellspring of vitality or fountain of youth has been a popular myth dating back thousands of years. In the third century A.D., Alexander the Great searched for a fountain of youth, supposedly crossing an otherworldly land covered in eternal night, called the Land of Darkness, to reach it. And another early formal written reference to such a place 
comes from the 5th century BCE, when the Greek historian Herodotus spoke of a wellspring in the land of the Macrobians. This small and secret body of water gave the people virility, health, and an exceptionally long life. During the Crusades there were many expeditions to the Middle East during the 11th and 12th centuries, and even in Japan, hot springs that can boost strength and restore youth are said to still exist today. Our quest for immortality has manifested itself in many ways over the millennia, with sacred charms, potions, and divine artifacts such as the Philosopher's Stone, all said to grant immortality. Maybe in some remote place there is a hidden spring, where bubbling forth is an elixir that can grant everlasting life to those who drink it, and the persistence of the myth has not yet dimmed. That's why there will always be adventure seekers looking for the magical fountain of youth, and who knows, maybe some have already found it but won't tell. Would you? The Elixir of Youth is the elixir of youth already hiding within us? It is the Mount Everest of scientific and health research, discovering the keys that will help people live longer. Now scientists may just be one step closer. A Yale School of Medicine team has identified a hormone, FGF-21, produced by the thymus gland, that can extend a lifespan by up to 40%. The hormone boosts the immune system and protects against the ravages of age. When it is functioning normally, the thymus produces new T-cells for the immune system. But as we age, the gland loses the ability to manufacture the vital cells. This loss of T-cells in the body is one cause of increased risk of infections, cancers, and cell destruction. Researchers led by Vishwa Dixit professor of comparative medicine and immunobiology at Yale, found that increasing the level of FGF-21 in old mice protected the thymus from age-related degeneration and increased their system's ability to produce new T-cells. This is one study on one hormone, and the team is confident it can lead to a future extension of life by up to 40%. Other studies are ongoing. We await their findings with interest, aging eyes, and hope. The Garden of Eden Whenever we think of the Garden of Eden, we usually think of the images of a pair of alabaster-skinned youths, buck-naked save for a fig leaf or two for modesty. There's an apple involved and usually a leering reptile somewhere to complete the picture. This is the biblical Garden of God described most notably in the book of Genesis, and also in the book of Ezekiel. However, there are numerous more references to trees of the garden, the place of trees, and simply the garden, in Genesis 13, Ezekiel 31, the book of Zechariah, and also the book of Psalms. All are said to reference Eden. The word Eden itself is related to an ancient Aramaic root word meaning fruitful and well-watered. Another clue is that the ancient name for Africa was Akebulan, Mother of Mankind, or Garden of Eden. The Moors, Nubians, Numidians, Carthaginians, and Ethiopians use this name. The name is an ancient one, many thousands of years old, and would have referred to northern Africa when it was lush and green rather than its current dry sub-Saharan manifestation. Lake Chad, now and before Lake Chad was there before the country. In fact, Lake Chad actually gave its name to the country of Chad, with the name being a local word meaning large expanse of water. Lake Chad today is a pale shadow of its former self, and is just the remnant of a former inland sea that archaeogeologists refer to as Paleo Lake Mega Chad. That part of Africa was much wetter than it is today due to climate cycles and the African rifts that created great watersheds or troughs. The lake was massive, 
and at its peak sometime before 5000 BCE, Lake Mega Chad was the largest of four Saharan Paleo lakes, and is estimated to have covered an area of nearly 400,000 square miles, larger than the Caspian Sea is today, and its depths reach down to 600 feet. Sadly, today Lake Chad has a surface area of only 520 square miles, an average depth of just 5 feet, and a maximum depth anywhere of 30 feet. And for the most part, it is more marshland than lake. Rock art from around Chad reflects the changing climate and environment. Much of the art there may date to up to 12,000 years or more and depicts many animal species that either don't inhabit the area anymore or are long extinct. Like much of the Sahara at that time, the area was lush and fertile and experienced an influx of wildlife and humans from the Middle East. But around 4,000 years ago, dramatic climate shifts forced the inhabitants to leave their lands and move to the Nile Valley or other areas with more water. The Poitinger Map The Poitinger Map, or Tabula Poitingeriana, is one of the first and largest fully illustrated road maps in existence. It shows the Cursus Publicus, the road network of the Roman Empire. At this point in time, it is kept at the Austrian National Library in Vienna. The original map was prepared by Agrippa during the reign of the Emperor Augustus, 27 BCE to AD 14. The present map is a 13th century copy of a 4th or 5th century copy and covers Europe, without Spain or the British Isles, North Africa, and parts of Asia as the Middle East, Persia, and India. The map was discovered by Conrad Keltes, hidden in a library in Worms. The man was unable to publish his find before his death and bequeathed the map in 1508 to Conrad Poitinger a German 15th to 16th century antiquarian after whom it is named. It was kept in the Poitinger family until 1714, when it was sold. It was next purchased by Prince Eugene of Savoy for 100 ducats, and upon his death in 1737, it was obtained for the Habsburg Imperial Court Library in Vienna, where it is today. In 1911, a sheet was added to show the missing sections of England and Spain. And then finally, in 2007, the map was placed on the UNESCO Memory of the World Register. In recognition of this unique event, it was displayed to the public for just a single day on 26 November 2007. Because of its rarity and fragile condition, it is now not on display and the general consensus is that it refers to fallen apostles or angels that have fallen from God's light, His grace. However, the majority of ancient biblical versions interpret the word to mean giants, and more fearsomely, the Symmachus translates it to mean the violent ones, or even, as per Aquila's translation, to mean the violent ones who fall upon their enemies. The Nephilim were said to be banished to the earthly plain to serve God's will and be sentinels and servants, violently if necessary. They would perform these tasks until the world ends, or until they manage to return to God's light through their good deeds and actions. Noah Was Noah real? Many believe so. He was said to have lived between approximately 2490 to 2415 BCE, when the Sahara experienced a wet period. This is the period of the Old Kingdoms, and a time when the land was split by vast waterways, all feeding into a massive inland sea, Chad. Research is blurred here, but one story refers to Noah as a descendant of the Proto-Saharan ruler named in Genesis 4 and 5, and not a humble or simple man. Instead, he was a local ruler, and like most of the local rulers named in Genesis, he controlled the major water systems of Lake Chad 
the Nile, and the Tigris and Euphrates. The interconnected waterways were their roads, and Noah would have known them like the back of his hand. He would have also been very familiar with boats, and likely had a fleet. In addition, Proto-Saharan rulers such as Noah kept menageries, with male and female specimen animals, for breeding purposes. Noah likely lived in the region of Borno, called the Land of Noah, near Lake Chad. This is the only place on earth that claims to be Noah's homeland. During Noah's time, the water systems of Lake Chad, the Benu Trough, and the Nile were connected, and Noah controlled the waterways of the Lake Chad Basin. If Noah did exist, he would have easily been able to construct an ark, stock it with animals, and keep his family safe from any flood. If the ark existed, then that's where its remains might just be. Noah's Ark and the Flood Noah's Ark is the vessel from the Genesis Flood, chapters 6 to 9, through which God saves Noah and his family, and also a portion of the world's animals. The Ark story is repeated in the Quran, and it is also similar to numerous other flood legends from a variety of cultures. The earliest known written flood myth is the Sumerian reference found in the epic of Ziosudra. Despite many expeditions, no scientific evidence of the Ark has been found. There are several reasons suggested for this, the most likely being that the Ark never existed. But given the time period, 4,500 years ago, then as the Ark was made of gopher wood, cedar, and mostly of reeds, there's little hope of finding remains after all this time. But for dreamers like myself, I tend to think that people are looking in the wrong place. Noah's Ark more likely came to rest on Mount Meru in East Africa, 230 miles from Lake Chad. The old Arabic text of Genesis 8-4 identifies the resting place as Har-Meni, which refers to the mountain of Meni, or Menes, another name for Mount Meru. The Final Resting Place of Noah There are many who claim to have the remains of Noah. Just a few are the Imam Ali Mosque, Najaf, in Iraq, the Tomb of Noah, Jordan, the Karak Nu, Lebanon, and also a vault in Cizre, Turkey. But the one with the most support from scholars is in the southern part of Nakhchivan, Azerbaijan where there is a mausoleum dated from the 8th century that is regarded as Noah's mausoleum, or the tomb of the prophet Noah. In the middle of that sunken vault there is a stone column, and according to legend, relics of Noah are buried there beneath it. Belinda hopes you enjoyed the reading of The Immortality Curse, written by Greg Beck and read by Sean Mangan. Our audiobooks are becoming increasingly popular among travelers, families, and people who are on the go. If you really enjoyed this audiobook, please introduce your friends and family to the experience. We're sure they'll love you for it. If you want to hear more about our fabulous range of titles, please visit us online at Belinda.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to always take a Belinda audiobook with you. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.